It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Therott is taking the week off, but we found two great replacements. Ed Bott will join us from CDNet and from Stardock, the founder 20 years ago, Brad Wardell. It's going to be a lot of fun. Of course, Mary Jo Foley, too. Windows Weekly is up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Windows Weekly with Paul Therod and Mary Jo Foley, episode 323, recorded August 8th, 2013. We are the 3.7%. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off, visit squarespace.com and use the offer code Windows8. And by audible.com to download a free audiobook of your choice go to audible.com slash windows it's time for windows weekly the show that covers all your microsoft goodies xbox windows and all office and all that jazz azure enterprise stuff with mary joe foley she's here from allaboutmicrosoft.com hi mary joe hi leo we were talking about you did an interview uh on what was it the tech um yep what the tech what the tech uh, where they asked you about you. So we never talk about you. No. And we learned so much. And now I want to have you on because I didn't know this. You had studied to be a chef, a vegetarian chef. Yep, I did. It's amazing. <laughs> well, introduce, if you will. We've got, uh, it took two people to replace Paul, Paul Thoreau's in Amsterdam. <laughs> and I guess, yeah. you know, he fell into a, sh a vat of shoof. Yeah. <laughs> Or something. <laughs> He's floating right now. Somewhere. Actually, I, I should right <laughs> off the top say we know shoof is made in Belgium. How did you let that slide, Mary Jo? I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> too, too much beer. Too much beer involved. <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, well, you know what? I'm kind of glad he kind of implied, I don't know if he said it or he implied that it was a Dutch beer. It's not, obviously. It's a Belgian beer. A very, apparently very good hoppy Belgian very, beer. Yes. Double IPA. Delicious. And uh, somebody who lives in Paris, Parisian fan with a taste for Belgian beers, sent me two bottles of Schouf. Should have sent them to you, Mary Jo. You would have appreciated them. But I've but I've shared it. I, one of our uh, employees is Belgian, and her oh, husband really? is huh. a yeah, Frederic, and her mm -hmm. husband is a massive fan of Belgian beers, and it happened okay. to be his birthday on Monday. Oh wow, perfect! So I gave him one bottle. Yep, only one. <laughs> 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 Keeping the other. Better watch out, so Liz is going to get that one. So, so shoof means the precious in Belgian. It's in, precious, uh, in, mon in precious. <laughs> hey, that's Ed Bot. Good to see you, Ed. Nice to see you, Leo. Another uh, ZD netter, uh, edbot.com. He's at edbot and a longtime observer of the PC scene going back to uh, PC. I always get it wrong. PC computing, right? You got it right. Yay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I remember that. Remember? Yeah, great. Brad, that's nice. Brad Wardell is also here. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> oh yeah, I was little at the time. Brad is from. Oh no, no, no I, I, no. You know, I was always lobbying for better OS2 coverage. You know, OS2 is coming back. It's only a matter. Oh, of Oh, you time. were one of those. It's so I funny. I was one of those guys. It's so funny because Paul was an Amiga guy, right? <laughs> and then, and then he drifted into Windows. You were OS2 drifted into Windows. Yeah. Um, and Mary Jo was a vegetarian drifted into Windows. I don't know what that's excuses. So many, so many diverse backgrounds. <laughs> anyway, it's great to it's great to have uh, Brad here. Is this your first time on the show, Brad? Uh, yeah, on on Twitter. I've been on. I was on Screensavers years ago. With, with Stardock. Yeah, with Stardock. Yeah, we loved Object. Still love Object Desktop. In fact, um, uh, thanks to Start Eight, I uh, I can I can tolerate Windows Eight. <laughs> But you should use Modern Mix, too, because it'll put all those I do. Metro Windows in a window. Th Paul has recommended both. A Modern Mix, and which is 5 bucks, and uh, Start 8, which is 5 bucks. For $10, you can turn Windows 8 into Windows 7. It's an amazing, <laughs> it's amazing, it's an amazing thing. Anyway, good to have you. He's the founder of uh, Stardock. Are you still at Stardock? I am. Awesome. I could tell. You know why? Because I'm looking at his uh, shot, and in the back behind him, there's a stack of O'Reilly programming books. <laughs> yeah. You have the nicest office. This is like my old office. Well, I'm at home today. Wow. But uh, this, so this is my home office. Beautiful. We're jealous. Oh, thanks. So Albuquerque, New York City, and where are you, Brad? I'm in uh, Canton, Michigan. 
and Canton, Michigan, where home I'd prices. I'd say Detroit, but then people would get afraid. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's a suburb. And, and yeah, actually, it's, it's, it's in the suburbs. It's, we always say, no, 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 it's near Ann Arbor. Detroit, that's mm. way off. East, yeah, nowhere off near east. Detroit. <laughs> right. And it's actually Santa Fe here. So. I'm sorry. Why did I say Albuquerque? I always think Albuquerque, Santa Fe. No, they're, they're right next to each other. <laughs> I have to get Ed on. I have to say one thing wrong about Ed on every show. I got PC computing yep. right. So. You got PC computing right. So yeah. this is your mandatory mistake. Santa you Fe. got it out of the way early. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> Yeah. No, no. My, I have plenty of mistakes in me. <laughs> I'm not, probably far from done. Well, let's uh, let's talk about Windows for a change. Yeah, because um, we never do. Never talk about oh. Windows. It's uh, <laughs> it's the unspoken uh, word here on the show. No, he, she's yeah. being facetious, obviously. I am. I am. Um, 8.1. Yep. Are we close? Ready to manufacture? We're getting close, I hear. Uh, I've gotten this question so much this week. How close are we to getting uh, seeing 8.1 RTM? Because we're all using the preview now and right. everyone's really anxious. We know it's going to be this month unless something happens, something drastic. Um, and what, I, what I've been hearing from my contacts this week is it is in escrow now. So it could be any day that we're going to get the RTM announcement. Any day. Any day now. But what does that mean? When it's, It doesn't mean that it'll be out in any day. It means they'll no. tell us when it'll be out. Nope. Yeah. I'm curious about Brad and, and Ed, what you guys think. Because I what I heard originally was as soon as it RTM'd, that Microsoft was going to go, okay, here are the bits. But I, now I'm hearing maybe there's going to be a slight delay. That's silly because that, they used to do that when it was a disk. <laughs> right. And you had to, you know, yeah. you had to yeah. ship a gold master out. Yeah. Yep. So I'm curious. What, if we're doing a date pool, guys, when, when are users going to get the bits? Beginning of September is what I would guess. Would you? Do you get at Stardock, do you get advanced anything, any copies or? It depends on who's politically strong at Microsoft at the time. There's been times <laughs> where we've gotten <laughs> alphabets. And uh, there's now, uh, more, most recently, I, I said, well, we really would like to get these builds early. Like, well, yeah, you just go to the build conference. You'll get a copy then. Oh. It's like, are you kidding? Oh, that's got to kill. Yeah. Uh, but that, you know, I'm sure that's always the case. How about you, Ed? Yeah. What are you, where, are you, where are you in this pool? Well, I'm thinking there's going to be three distinct milestones. One will be when it's released to uh, MSDN, mm -hmm. which I think will be uh, the week of the 15th or so of August. And then that's, uh, and that's then next another, week. Oh, that's what I'm, yeah, I'm thinking it'll be fairly quick. Maybe yeah. a couple days after RTM, but fairly quick to MSDN. But then a customer preview a week or two after that. but And of course, the OEM uh, retail copy is not until probably uh, around the one year anniversary of Windows 8, October 26th. Boy, that's such oh, wow. a distance between I know. the final So you think bits. they'll have a launch? I wonder if we're going to have a launch this year. Because, you know, now they're calling this an update, right? And not an upgrade. They're, make, they're being very clear on that, saying right. it's an update to Windows 8. So, you know, does that warrant a huge launch? I mean, maybe, maybe if there's a whole bunch of new hardware running it, it could. Yeah, that's what it's all about is the hardware. Yeah. The, the, uh, and, and especially the devices like the rumored small surface device that uh, would need to be running the final release of Windows 8.1 to, to make sense. True. Yeah, I wonder how the much the Windows RT edition comes into these uh, into the timing too, because obviously they're going to want to put both up at the same time. Right. Yep. And well, Windows Server, right? And Windows Server yeah. also plays in because there's the Windows Server 2012 R2 also at the same time. So there's a lot of things that are all converging as as usual with Windows. Right. Yeah, I've been getting a lot of, uh, now you have a Surface RT, I think, Mary Jo, right? I mean, I the RT yeah. edition, yeah. Have you been noticing it. a lot of updates lately, a lot of system level updates? It makes yeah. me think that they're getting ready to, they're setting it up to make sure that the upgrade to Windows 8.1 is uh, seamless. Because obviously on a, on a Surface RT, it's not like a PC where if something goes wrong, you can just go, well, I'll just insert a CD in the drive. And, right. I mean, yeah. it, it, it gets bricked, it's bricked. Yeah. Is there any yeah. precedent for an upgrade like this getting so much attention and so much? I mean, if it's just an upgrade, this is well, Windows yeah. 3.1. 3.1 to 3.0, you think it's equivalent to that? 
No. Yeah, three point. Yeah, because if Windows three point oh was a you know, obviously a big milestone at the time, right? And then, but it was three point one that really made it useful. Some I mean, might 3.0 argue three point one one. Windows yeah. for work groups, right? Windows for work groups. Yeah. <laughs> I always think of that one as the one that uh, broke OS two. <laughs> You're back on the OS two. I know. Yeah. Brad's <laughs> always going to go back to OS two. I when I first met Brad like 15 years ago, he was working on OS two. That's how we first got to know each other. Were you at I IBM, to, Brad? Is that no? no. I was Stardock back. This is uh, yeah. Stardock's 20th year. Wow. So yeah. the so Stardock was originally founded to uh, create extensions for OS two. Yep. Yeah. It would basically, do kind of what we do for Windows, except we did it for OS two back then. Wow, I didn't realize that. Well, I mean, the name Object Desktop kind of gives it away. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I guess so. Um, wow. So you survived OS two, which a lot of companies didn't. Just <laughs> barely. You almost could, almost could argue IBM didn't survive OS two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think they're now a services company yeah. or something yeah. like that. They don't even make. I mean, they yeah. don't even make PCs. Yeah, you did better than IBM with the OS two thing. <laughs> <laughs> Although Warp was pretty amazing, uh, and and it, like the Amiga, there's just certain th platforms. BOS for me. Where oh, I just yeah. think, gosh, these were really great. It's it's a shame they didn't survive, but it's an object lesson, if you'll forgive the uh, uh, pun, uh, because it reminds all of us that the best technologies don't necessarily win. It has yep. nothing to do really with that. Yep. Well, it has a little to do with it, but not much. I know. Yeah, yep. yeah. So um, you're too young to remember all this, Mary Jo. But those were the days. Uh. Yeah, I, I actually... Uh, Before any I women were involved in this. Yeah, exactly. All right. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what's funny? When I, when I One of the first things I was assigned to do when I worked at PC Week, I was covering Microsoft, and they said, you know what, we're also going to have you cover OS 2. And so you're going to cover the war between OS 2 and Windows. Wow. And that was the only time in all the time I've done tech reporting, I actually got death threats. <gasps> It was that bad. Not all it those were for me. Bad. I just want that on the record. No, only, Not all Brad those came only for a me. Couple of them. But, but observe, <laughs> he's still, you know, he's not, he's, you sense a little bitter over the whole OS2 thing. Exactly. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I loved OS2, but I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm a pretty big Windows zealot these you days. You have to be, sure. That's that's where the... Well, and, and as and long as I Microsoft keeps that. screwing up with Windows, you're in, Start Stardock is in great shape. Well, Windows 8 has been like a, you know, a, boon. a gift from God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a boon. How, yeah, what do you do after then? window blinds, which is still reasonably popular, but people aren't skiing their UI anymore? And then Microsoft right. comes out with this this uh, hybrid tablet slash desktop OS, and you have all these. It's not even the consumers. It's the it's the banks, the enterprises who want to migrate to Windows 8 yeah. because that's what's on the new machines, and they're like. Well, where's the start menu? You go, oh, well, you need to click it. Well, on Windows 8.1, you click on a button, it takes you a completely different screen, and then you sift through that. Like, oh, that's too much. Will 8.1 solve that problem for people? I mean, there's no start menu. It's really the start menu is, is, the, is the main problem. It depends on what you're doing, but it, it's, it's a paradigm shift, right? I, I like Metro on my uh, Surface RT, when I'm, but it would be kind of like trying to jam the iOS environment onto a Mac. I, when I'm using a desktop PC, I want to use a desktop PC. I don't want to be using it as a consumer device. And that's that's the problem I have with Metro is that I'm doing my work. I want to have lots of windows on my desktop. I want to copy and paste between things easily. I want to drag and drop things. But now with Windows 8.1, I mean, it's it's they're j f trying to force you to work a certain way. Right. And that's not intuitive. Not doesn't lend itself to high productivity. So eight point one is not going to solve that to the degree that you have to think of. And well, I noticed you bought Star Control, so yeah. that's the new strategy, right? <laughs> Bring back Atari yeah. games. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's his hedge in case all. I else try goes. to get Master Ryan, but we. Got oh, help. I'm actually thrilled about this. I want to play Star Control. I love it. <laughs> Are you gonna you're gonna do a new version, right? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're hiring up people to uh, to build a new Star Control game. Before we uh, started, I because I observed the programming books on Brad's desk. I said, "Are you st are you still writing software?" Because a lot of times, <laughs> you know, the guys who found the company twenty years later, they couldn't code a line. You know, they're <laughs> well. I'm sure that there's people at work that wish wish I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, said, oh, yeah, you said you said you do the game AIs. <laughs> you do the game AIs, which is kind of uh, in some ways, I think that's the most sophisticated of the programming, really. Well, it's more of a, 
game AI is more of an art than a science. Yeah. So just it's hard to teach someone how to do it because a lot of times people who program games aren't very good at them. And good AI requires a person to be playing the game over right. and over and right. And I'm I'm happy to sacrifice and play the games over and over again. <laughs> what a life! <laughs> How about Star Raiders? Anytime you want to bring back Star Raiders, I'm there. Oh, now you're really bringing back. <laughs> and uh, and I have in my hands the uh, bat the uh, what was the tank uh, game? Uh, Battlezone. Battlezone. Battlezone actually was bought at that at the Atari auction by really? uh, a company called Rebellion Games. Because I have in muscle memory. Mm, 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 the because you had two throttles and you steer right. the tank like a real tank by changing the throttles and I'm sorry I got off track. So, <laughs> back to Windows Star, 8. Go ahead. Star Raiders, the Star Raiders was the one with the little triangles. Pew 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 pew. Rah, 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 and then you go and you get into uh, you get into uh, uh, you know uh, hyper hyperspace. You know and it was and, and fun. It was part of time, it was it, really neat. It was, it was the game. I bought an Atari 400 to play Star Raiders, uh, and it was yeah, the that was game. One of the downside. Now, see Paul Thoreau. His uh, he had an uh, he had an Amiga, so no Couldn't Star Raiders for him. But he had a great bouncing ball. Yeah, yeah the great checkered red and white ball. <laughs> he yeah. had that. I can't deny it. Uh, all right, let's get back to the uh, matter at hand. Windows 8. Uh, what 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 else do we know? So uh, uh, there is a difference of opinion. The soonest we'll possibly see it is Ed Bots next week on uh, MSDN. But Ed, why would they wait till mid October if they've got the final bits done now? Why wait two more months to release the final? Uh, well, it's because it, it's a a reflection of the historical relationship between OEMs and uh, and uh, Microsoft. Yeah, but that was when you had to take a, put a, a gold master in a truck and drive yeah. it down there, drive it down yeah. to Dell, right? Yeah, well, but like I said, I think it'll be released to the public in a matter of, you know, in a matter of weeks. So that if you already... And oh, I so see. If you so, have a Windows 8 system or you buy a new I Windows 8 system, you could just you install, install it. you install Windows 8.1 through the Windows Store. I got it. You don't have to go. You don't have to buy a disk or anything. I'm talking for October. I'm yeah. talking about availability in shrink wrap boxes, no. and will they? and on. Well, yes, of course they will. They'll, there will be 8.1. Can you I mean, buy a box of Windows 8? Sure, you can. Really? Yeah, you can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where? <laughs> from from just about anywhere, Leo. Best Buy. Best Staples. Buy <laughs> yeah, probably. I yeah. still see box software on the rack at Staples, and I think, wow, yeah. I'm traveling through time. Well, if you have a, I mean, if you have a, a DSL connection. Yeah, no, no, it makes even, sense, yeah. Uh, you know, much yeah. less a dial-up connection. But there are people with, I have neighbors who have DSL connections that it would take them 12 hours to download, but they're going to be a little disadvantaged because they can't, they will not be able to do Windows 8.1 unless they're very patient until you think September or October, till a boxed yeah. copy. Well, the the no no well the, now you'll have to charge for a boxed copy. What I'm talking about with the boxed copies are people who want Fully. to go up get the full yeah, package product. So what does somebody who is bandwidth challenged do? They're running Windows 8 today. And they want to get to 8.1. Well, if you're running it today, you're just going to get it. You're just going to get it through the store, right? Yeah, but that means a download. Yeah. How big is it? Do we know? Well, I would imagine it's the same as the preview, which is about 1.6 gigabytes. So your neighbors are not going to be happy. They would just take that long. They're probably still back on XP. Come on, be honest. Yeah, those are the people we should worry about. The ones who are going to go straight from XP to Windows 8.1. Yeah, did you hear about that Japanese company that's doing yeah. that? They're going right, yeah. right from XP they're, to Windows 8. They're, Holy cow. They're going to have to learn that you can't use Z modem anymore. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're even in our show notes today because maybe, maybe we should talk about them now. They're in yeah. the Windows section. Yeah, um, yeah. 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 It, this was kind of crazy, right? So there's this Japanese insurance company uh, that Microsoft announced this, this is a case, Microsoft's publishing this as a case study. They are. Yeah. They have 30, they're going to have 30,000 people. cautionary tale. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> moving from XP to Windows 8. Uh, it's actually not just, 
not just Windows 8, to tablets. Tablets. Yeah. To Windows 8. So it's going to be Windows 8 Pro, like I, uh, on a custom tablet that Fujitsu's designed for them. Although and I'm sure Fujitsu's holding that. It hand. is the sales personnel. And I think a it tablet, is. for it salespeople, is. often a tablet is a really great yeah. improvement. Because they're not doing, they're not writing novels. No. They're doing presentations. <laughs> they're they're well, saying, so, see this, we can make this, that. So let, let me be the contrarian one here instead of laughing at this. Because I think there's, uh, there's probably, there's, I know a lot of people who have to use Windows XP at work. Oh, yeah. Who find it incredibly frustrating because they're running a modern operating system at home. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh and they have an iPad, and they have a smartphone, and they're used to doing all those oh, things yes. with... Oh, yes. No, no, you're not a contrarian. No, uh, we know we in agree. business, XP is still dominant in many cases. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, I agree so for them... They, they, they go home and they're using something decent, and then they go to work and they're using something primitive like yeah. Windows XP. But, it, you know, it, is that really... Do, do people complain about that? Because often when they're using XP, they're using line of business software. They're barely seeing the OS... Yeah. Right, they're they're kind of locked into this. Is my workstation? Mm -hmm. They're not trying to do photo editing. Well, One of the most common scenario I see are like at banks or something where yeah. they've got reasonably modern hardware, but it's all been built with XP right. because they're right. using some they custom it. app right. and it's running in a tiny window. They need ActiveX. It's, it's horrible. Yeah, no, yeah, it's uh, not even ActiveX. It's probably using Access Database <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and you know, I imagine a uh, a, a a modern uh, Windows 8 box where it's running a Surface Pro or something uh, similar to that would probably work pretty well for them because if they're just running one app, then they don't need all the other junk that's associated with Windows XP. Yeah. Right. And, and it said in the case study, I believe, that a, a lot of their procedures are actually paper-based. So it's not even like they're ha going to have this big hurdle because they have to move apps over to <laughs> that's Windows the 8. hurdle. Yeah, the, per the hurdle is the business Paper. process. Right? But uh, yeah. And also, this is yeah. Japan. This is not a Roman alphabet. Uh, uh, I yeah. don't know what it's like. I, in China, for instance, is a, a complex thing to, to use Chinese characters uh, yeah. with a PC. I, in Japan, I think it's a little simpler, but still. 65,000 characters in kanji, I think. Is it? Yeah. Well, do they? Okay, I know, I'm going to show my real ignorance here. I don't, do they typically in business, would you use kanji or... Would you use something similar? What is it? Kat kata, katana? Katakana. Katakana. Katana is a knife. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to. You might want to use a knife after yeah. XP and a yeah. paper. But, but isn't katakana <laughs> uh, simpler? Do you know that, Ed? It seems like it's a simpler alphabet. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't. Yeah, but I'll ignorance. bet somebody in the I'll bet somebody in the chat room the does. The chat yeah. room will. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I, will. I know. I know Japanese use kanji all the time, but I'm wondering in business with PCs to simplify things. I'm sorry. I, 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 you're wrong, Leo. A katana is a sword, not a knife. Oops. <laughs> oh. So there. So near. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I know in China there's a great move to to the Roman alphabet and even to English for this reason. Uh, computing is just much simpler if you can use a, a, a 26 letter alphabet over a 65,000 character. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Set. yeah. Yeah. Smaller keyboard. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, but what what makes this case study so interesting besides what we've already said is is just you know we we hadn't heard about a lot of people going straight from XP to Windows eight one or even Windows eight like they, a lot of people were going Windows seven as the interim step, um, XP to seven and then going seven to eight. So you know when I, I I tweeted that this was happening and people were like, whoa, I wouldn't want to be that IT guy and good uh, luck guy. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if you're only running Perfect. one or two apps, the Metro yeah. UI is really nice for that. And if you can make a, your app a native uh, RT app, yeah, I mean yeah. it's it's perfect. Yeah. Well, plus the tools, the migration tools and the deployment tools, are you know a, as you get further along in the evolutionary chain of Windows, they get better. The ones for Windows 8 are better than the ones for Windows sure. 7, which were way better than the ones for, for XP. So the IT guys are doing handsprings of joy uh, at, at, the <laughs> yeah. prospect of, at the prospect of deploying this stuff because they've got better tools to work with. Right. Now it's the trainers who yeah. have, have a, a challenge ahead of them, but not an insurmountable one. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, They're it's really when you go you. back and use, you go to your relative's house and they're running Windows XP and they bought some new piece of hardware and they can't get it to work on there. And you're like, oh, yeah, I remember back in 2001 that you it used to be a pain in the butt. Whereas now I plug something in, I got a, uh, a tablet, and, uh, I mean a drawing tablet, and I just plug it into the USB port and it just works. I, I, I don't know if there's drivers, whereas back then it's like, Please insert your floppy disk. Uh, you know, like, what? I had to put a floppy disk? I, I can't remember. I don't even have a floppy drive. Where is well, a and, colon and if the drivers aren't, yeah. And if the drivers aren't in the box, uh, yeah. they usually download automatically. Right. Right. You know, for, for most reasonably mainstream devices, you just get a prompt that says, hey, I've got some drivers here. Shall I download them and make your device work? So. The bigger issue is going to be Metro, and Ed has written a nice article, The Metro Hater's Guide to Windows 8.1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ed, do you, li you like Metro. You like Windows 8, as I remember. I, I do, but, but my philosophy towards this stuff is always about uh, just, you know, it is what it is, and how do you make it work best for you? I tend to accept what it is and go from there, as opposed to, you know, getting... getting uh, antsy about it you know so that's me yeah well you you've been through this before i have <laughs> what did you <laughs> what did you twice. what did you start uh pc computing was it 95 or was it earlier than that windows oh 95? no i started at pc windows. computing in 91 so it was windows oh. 3 1 3 windows windows windows, windows 3 DOS, dos 5 and windows 3 0 or was it dos 3 3 we, we had the iHeart DOS uh, bumper sticker that we bound into one issue of... I um, want that! I want I, that! And, and in my first year at, uh, at PC Computing, I did uh, a monthly column that had DOS tips in it, and I also did all of our OS2 coverage, oh. including you trips down to Boca to meet with the, uh, with the IBM mm -hmm, mm -hmm, down mm -hmm. there. At Yakabuchi and group. All that, the that late, whole game. The late, great Ed Yakabuchi. Yeah. Uh, so what do you say to people who are Metro haters about Windows 8.1? Will they feel better? Well, yeah, there's basically, once once you accept the fact that uh, that there is no start menu, there's a whole bunch of things you can do that uh, make the experience a lot better. And, and there's a, what I found interesting is that there isn't a single button you can push that says, make this act like Windows 7. But there is, a, you know, about four steps that you go through. It takes a grand total of about three minutes. And you're pretty much back to the only thing you have to deal with that's new is the start screen. And even there, uh, with, the, with the shared start screen option between the desktop and, uh, and the, start, the shared background, uh, you can avoid that jarring Feeling. You know, it's so funny. We were talking about that. It's so funny. So one of the things 8.1 does is allows you to have the same desktop on the start screen as you have on your desktop. So then when you hit the Windows menu button or your Windows key and it right. swaps over there, it f isn't that weird? It's psychology. It's pure psychology, but it feels like, yeah. oh, this is a menu. Right. It's well, not as, that's, it's, I wish they had done that in 8 because I think a lot of the Metro angst. No, you don't. Bit. No, you. Oh, yeah. May I remind you? <laughs> may I remind you, Brad, how you make your money? No, you don't. There's so many things. Are you kidding? We have so much stuff that we're. I would rather have spent last year fixing the start screen, and instead we're having to wait until now to get to work on making the start screen not so you know. Horrible. You had a didn't you have an app that would allow me to put a different background on the start screen, or am I missed? We do. We have yeah. uh, decorate. Which decorate. That's that. right. Yeah, with an eight. Get it? Yeah. yeah. So, but that's something that I don't. Do actually, I I find the so the shared background to me uh, reminds me of icons on the Windows the, the classic Windows desktop. It's kind of like hitting the right. the reveal desktop right. button, right? And then you have and, all and, these icons. Yeah, and and with Windows eight point one, you have smaller tiles, right? So, which are much closer in size. To oh, good. Classic. Well, Windows desktop. So you'll have it's, three choices now. You have the big wide one, the the square. You actually have four. Four. You actually have four. There's a there's a large uh, for apps like weather and news. There's a there's one that's twice the size of the Windows 8. Is it wide. square? Is it like double double bar? 
Correct. Okay. It's it's yeah. It's double the height. It's right. the same width and double the height, and so you can get like a three day weather forecast in there. So you've got that. You have the the wide tile that that's that you have in Windows 8. You have the half size square tile, like there is in Windows 8, and then you have uh, tiles that are one quarter the size of that small square, so that in the size of a single wide Windows 8 tile, you can have eight icons. So you could put all of Office 2010 or Office 2013, an icon for every program in that suite, into the space that's occupied by a single Windows 8 wide tile now. Yeah, that's cool. I guess. So it, I mean, the choice it, is it, nice. It, it feels, in that case, it feels more like the old Windows desktop. I mean, it, we all have seen the situation, you know, you go in and you sit down at somebody's computer to help them fix a problem and you look at their desktop and it's just row or column after column and row after row of icons, the entire desktop covered with icons. Yeah, that's... we make a product that fixes that. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> we make fences. Oh, yeah, fences. Yeah, but you organize yeah. your uh, desktop in the fences and then you just double click on the desktop to hide all your icons. But that's really, the people who do all those icons either do it pre preference, and I remember Patrick Norton, you know, you would you would uh, minimize all the windows, and all of a sudden there was this forest of icons, and he liked right. that. And then the other people who do that are people like my mom, who just saved a desktop. Yeah, and all their documents are there. Everything's, and they're not going to use fences. They just, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I remember once uh, with uh, Jennifer. I uh, she this actually was on the uh, iPad. No, was it? The, what was it? It was no. I guess it was Windows or Macintosh. Uh, she had, you know, she never would close an app. So she had hundreds. So finally, I, you know, I said, well, let me just close these apps and see if the machine speeds up a little bit. So I closed everything. She said, what's that? I said, that's your desktop. She said, what's all those things on it? I said, those are your, <laughs> those are your files. That, wow. But that's not unusual. I think that's a very yeah. common use case. Yeah. Uh, that and the, uh, the system tray. Well, now that they hide it, thank goodness. But I remember going over to people's houses who oh, needed yes. help, and their it's, system tray would wide. be bigger than their taskbar because they had so much <laughs> crap on in their system tray. You mean you can you can take stuff out of that? <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow! All this time. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Brad will make a house call and fix that. For you. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. I'm just I'm yeah. just teasing. Um, so, what do you suggest people do if they are Metro haters? There's no uh, Metro is still there. I actually like it. Love Modern Mix. I'm going to give you another plug because uh, Start Eight. I've recommended that many times on the radio show, which replaces the st the you know the startless button on Windows Eight with a start menu, and then uh, Modern Mix, which Paul Thorat recommended first. That's when I started using it, which takes Metro apps and puts them in a window. Right, and and those are those are good. I mean, it's basically a series of steps that you go through. If you say you're not going to use uh, Metro apps at all. I just want to, I want to have, I want to be able to take advantage of all the good new stuff in Windows 8, uh, uh, you know, faster startups, you know, better performance, better security, all those things. But I just want a pure desktop environment. A couple of things they've done. Uh, number one, you can just right click every single Metro program on, on the uh, start screen and click on install oh. and boom, they're gone. Oh, get rid yeah, of so, it. Just get rid and, of it. And in Windows 8, uh, you have to do that one program Can at a time. Can you get rid of Metro Internet Explorer? Uh, I so like then Metro that's, Internet that's Explorer. The, well, that's the next step that you go through. If you say you don't want to be confused by that, there's an option in Internet Explorer where you go in and you say, always use the desktop version. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what that's saying is whenever I click a link, launch the desktop version, right? You're saying my preferred browser is desktop. Or will it never again show my Metro Internet Explorer? It will not show oh, the that's good. Metro. It, you can remove the, uh, the Metro Internet Explorer icon from the desktop. And then when you set that option, even clicking a link from the start screen we'll will take you to the desktop. desktop. You, you will. Yeah. In fact, I had this set uh, yesterday, I had that setting set because I was I was testing it, and it, you, you it's almost impossible to bring up the Metro version of Internet Explorer if you have that option set. Because in my opinion, you, you may like it, you may like Metro Explorer, Brad, but that is a real source of confusion that you have two different Internet Explorers. They behave differently. They have a, a different place for the URL. One's at the top. One's at the bottom. Um, one doesn't do flash. One does. That's really a stupid. Yeah, that, that, it, that's true, especially on the flash part. That's too. very confusing to normal people because you don't know immediately which one you're in. They both do flash. They do now. They do. Okay. They didn't. I, I, they didn't at first. 
Well, I'm running RT, so my uh, obviously my uh, Internet Explorer right, does not. I know. Right. R here, RT yeah. does flash. RT has flash. Well, what am I? In, what am I thinking of? Then there's some you're thinking, of, you're thinking of. You're thinking of. I don't all, think so. You're thinking of all add-ins except flash. flash. Yeah, LastPass, for instance, in. which I am dependent on LastPass because I don't know any right. passwords, does not right. work on Metro. There's a good example for me, but that's LastPass, not universal. Silverlight. Silverlight. That's Silverlight. the one I was thinking of. Silverlight. Microsoft's <laughs> own. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not going to say Well, this. they're basically uh. trying to create a plug-in free uh, en environment there because you uh, you can't install a toolbar right. Uh, <laughs> right. in there. So. And somebody's saying, well, one is for touch and, and one is for desktop. Fine. But I but what if you're using a computer? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, so, so I mean, just to just to be a Metro non-hater. Yes, for a second, please defend the, Metro. So I have uh, a program that I'm using as a as a uh, an RSS reader called uh, Next Gen Reader right now. Mm -hmm. And it's connected to Feedly. Uh, it works great. It's a great replacement for Google Reader. Cool. And uh, it's a Metro style app. And in Windows 8.1, what's cool, although they still need to, uh, there's a new version of it coming out that will work better in a snapped mode. But basically, when you click a link from, uh, from a, an item in uh, an RSS feed, it opens the Metro version of Internet Explorer right alongside of it. Boom. So you've got them side by side and it neatly snaps them together. Then you go to the next article, click a link, and there they are together. And that uh, integration is very smooth and very graceful. It's That's the scenario where it works very well, even on a desktop. If you, if you just want to have a non-cluttered, non-distracting, uh, RSS feed. I want to go through my RSS feeds in the morning to get my day started. Boom. That does it. And you don't have to worry about resizing windows and right. you don't have any of your desktop wasted with menus and uh, window borders and uh, icons and things like that. So there's a scenario where it works. Yes. But I but I agree with you that the, uh, the sort of game of Internet Explorer roulette where you don't know which whether you're going to go confusing. to the desktop version yeah. or the metro version yeah. is confusing, especially to non-technical people. Yeah, and me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm easily confused. I agree with you. I, I, I think full screen, in, and there are cases on the desktop where full screen is great. Um, yeah. And I use, in fact, on, on my Mac, I'm full screen often for mail and for, because you're right, you want a non-distracted. Most people are. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing. That's the research. The research that led to Windows 8 is because most people almost all the time are running one application maximized right but the trouble is that the you know the the four of us uh and uh virtually everybody in the audience that's watching this and interacting in the chat room <laughs> are not in you know we're we're the one percent right now, i'm not confused <laughs> leo's an idiot that kind of thing uh <laughs> Well, I just don't like the two paradigms. I mean, right. being side by side it's in a, the same it's a, environment. It's like, a mistake in user eye, in user interface design. I expect on a PC at this point to be able to drag and drop stuff between apps. It's kind of a right. kind of a thing, drag and drop. And uh, with uh, the problem I have with RT is that it's all sandbox. So trying to get one app to interact interoperate with another in ways that were not decided by the app maker or Microsoft becomes problematic. Whereas I'm I, I use drag and drop for images and other types of objects all the time. Now I know I'm in that one percent of in that I'm producing content, uh, you know, software in my case. But for people who are using Windows as a desktop product productivity environment, trying to turn it into a tablet environment, a consumption device is really problematic. Yeah. So uh, your advice, Ed, first is uh, if you're a Metro hater, uninstall. You can uninstall all the Metro apps. You can change all, Internet yeah, Explorer to use yeah, the desktop right. only. What else? Uh, just uh, I like to change the start screen background to something neutral, gray or black or something like that, and then have only the icons that you want or the tiles that right. you want on there. Now, that's and, a Windows 8.1 feature. That's not an 8.0. 8 you only have the, uh, the fake henna tattoos. As an 
Uh, no, 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 no. Can you, you change it, the color? It, oh, all right. In Windows 8, you can you can remove the pattern and you can change it to a neutral gray. That's something that you can do. Uh, you can you get a choice of I think 20 colors in Windows 8, and it's you know several okay. thousand. So make it in, a neutral color. I hear someday we'll get up to 256 colors. But that's <laughs> eight bit, baby. I don't know if we're ready for that. When when we go to 64K, all bits are off, man. That's, uh, <laughs> No one yes. will ever need more than forty-eight k. No, but so, but then, so yeah, so you do, okay. so you do that so that uh, and basically, if you if you hate the start screen, then the easy thing to do is remove everything from it, unpin everything from it yeah. except the desktop. So if you accidentally find yourself on the you on the start screen and you're you press back. enter, yeah, and you're, you're and back. you're back at the desktop yeah. where you want it yeah, to that's be. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, and then and that's. Pretty much. That's pretty much it. There's a full article, uh, Edward. Oh, I'm sorry. There is one. There is one other step uh, yeah. in there. Uh, you also need to change the defaults for just a handful of file types, uh, images, uh, uh, whatever see. that. So you could choose your browser, your email, your uh, music, music player. Uh, yeah, digital media files mostly. Right. So that you want. Uh, so that if you're using uh, a PDF files. So you uh, could even well, say, I want Chrome all the time and make that the default browser and you would never see Internet Explorer, Metro or desktop. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. If, if you do that, then, yeah. And what's interesting is the current versions of Chrome actually have a Metro option in them. Right, right. But you have to go to the Chrome menu. Right, I remember that. And, now, yeah. and, and pull it down. Now, one reason I don't use Chrome is because it is terrible on a touch screen. Yes, yeah. uh, the targets are all so small. Yeah. It, well, not just that, but you can't you can't actually navigate with your finger. You using, can't scroll and like that. It, it's it's just awful to use. Right. Uh, Firefox is much better if you if you don't want to use Internet Explorer. Okay. Uh, Firefox is a much better uh, alternative I've found, especially the the more recent versions. But yeah. most people who need who want Chrome who like Chrome are doing it because they're in the Google ecosystem. Right. And you want, uh, you know, the Gmail app inside and the of Chrome. And syncing and all of that. You know, didn't, didn't Google add a couple of touch things this week, though, to Chrome? Oh, did they? Oh, I, thought, nice. I thought I saw that. You know, it's sometimes. funny. I completely See. capitulated on my uh, uh, my Acer, and I just use, like, pure Windows. I didn't. You do? I just, yeah, I gave up. It's like, yeah. I, it's too hard to fight Metro. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm using Internet Explorer. Yeah. And because uh, it's just, you know, the, I'm going to do it the way it was meant to be done. <laughs> It's just the way it is. The and way the internet gods intended. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Mr. Balmer told me to do it this way, and I'm going to do it this way. Uh, but, and, and, and that's Windows 8. Yeah, and it's 8. And I, I'm really looking forward to 8.1. Yeah, I'm amazed. If you have an RT device, uh, like the Surface RT. I dropped mine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, just the amount of progress that they made on Surface RT from when it launched to where it is today, it's almost like a next generation is device. Oh, Even right now, it's actually quite usable. Whereas when I first got it, Office on it was terrible. I couldn't, it couldn't even keep up with my typing. Right. So it's better not now. That, it's way better. It's as good fixed. as getting a, it's as if a Surface RT 2 came out and it didn't tell me because I just got all yeah. these updates and suddenly it's, do you remember how SkyDrive or, What's currently called SkyDrive mm -hmm. was at launch. It was completely useless, and now it's it's pretty good. Huh? I'll, I'll get mine fixed. Do you do you, you find that too, Mary? Mary Joe, I think you yeah. use uh, Surface RT as your main. I do. Computer. Uh, well, that, yeah, I'm using my Surface RT with my Windows Seven everyday machine, so it's right. like my companion device. And right. I've I've been running the preview on Surface RT, and I I like it. Um, I've had a couple weird problems. Like I I I don't know if anybody else there has had this, but um. My mail app now is really laggy. The Windows Mail app. Not I'm not talking about Outlook RT because I'm still trying to use both. But um, such a bad app from day one. It it got yeah. even slower when I put the preview on, uh, and I don't know why. Uh, like when I turn my Surface RT on, it takes forever for the Mail app to kind of catch up. And I have the, I have it set to sync in the background, and it should be running in the background. So I don't know what's going on there. Um, and the other weird, really weird problem I'm having lately is with uh, IE 11 on my Surface RT. Um, like when I try to browse something, it pulls up all these old tabs and old links. And it, it takes, again, it's like taking a really long time to sync or, or let me sync up to the thing that I'm trying to actually put into the URL bar. 
Uh, and I don't think I've changed any settings or done anything strange. And uh, I've been downloading all the all the updates as they come through, and I don't know why that is either. So I'm I'm kind of holding my breath and hoping when this does RTM, a lot of these things will be ironed out. You have an article Ed, on the mistakes Microsoft made with Windows 8 uh, that they're fixing with 8.1. So you do agree that 8 might have had some rough edges. Oh, I've I've said that from day one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now I think that you know the most important feature of Windows 8 was the ability to do annual updates to it. Uh, was that in, something? In a way. Oh, so that's something special built in that you could go to the Metro Store and download an update like that. That was something they had to build into it. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the, to architect the operating system, but but both the arc, both to build the operating system so that it could be updated like that is part of it, but also to change the development cycle so that instead of, you know, Big Bang and then tiny little uh, uh, fixes for three years and then another Big Bang, it's uh, we're going to do the equivalent of two years worth of features right. every year. Right. So, they're, so, they've, so they've sort of doubled the pace of development and tripled the pace of updates. Is it your sense that they're going to every year now do uh, an update like 8.1? Yes. And it'll be yep. a free upgrade every year? I don't know about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we don't know what will happen when, when they go to Windows 9, whenever that is, right? Like, or if they ever will. We, we don't really know how that's going to go in the future. They could do, though, could they do a Windows 9 via this update up mechanism? That's just a number. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just a, uh, I'm, well, good point. I'm, Depends on market. I'm nine, no, it's just you know a number, what, Leo. I'm, when I'm they saying can do nine, anything they no, want. I'm, <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking the difference between updates and upgrades, right? So like things like 8.1, 8.2, 8.3 are updates. But then uh, something that is an upgrade is like when you are right. going to have a whole right. new, new version that, yeah. that's so substantially different. Yeah. It's not just a, a, an incremental upgrade. Right. So whatever but that's, that's called. A, but that is ultimately a marketing decision. Right. It is. It is. No. Sure. There, there's, there's, some, there's some technical, though. I mean, uh, you know, there are some changes that you would have to hold off for an upgrade. Well, uh, Windows XP Service Pack 2, Mary Jo knows upgrade. this yeah. better than upgrade. anyone. <laughs> yeah. that, that should have been... Yeah. An upgrade Ex that should have been yeah. a, a paid yeah. for yeah. upgrade. Uh, it had uh, massive changes to the underpinnings of right. Windows, uh, and, and you know changes to default firewall behavior, right. Right. a whole bunch of stuff in there. But they made it a free it's, service. Pack. It's kind of analogous to what they're doing now, isn't it? It, it is a service pack uh, too. Yeah, yeah. And I think one thing you're going to see is. Uh, you know, Microsoft's revenue stream is has always been for Windows has always been ninety percent from OEMs anyway. Well, that's uh, got to be changing, don't you think? Right. With Microsoft yeah. in the hardware business, for one thing. Well, maybe, well, maybe the not. Service but arts, they're barely in the hardware. <laughs> they only made eight hundred million. <laughs> or, yeah. They only had eight hundred revenue. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a big. Yeah, but no, it, I, but no, I they, think they, that they, is going to change. But they want to get the revenue from services as well right, right. Uh, so 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 I think you know the, the interesting thing is office has always been the stocking horse for Windows the ribbon showed up right. in office first and then it showed up in in Windows right. product activation showed right. up in office first then it showed up in Windows office as a as a service is available now I think we will see Windows as a service uh, available, you know, at at some point in the future. Wow, Windows three sixty five. Wow, coming to a <laughs> wow. That's probably. What do, mean, what do you mean by that, Ed? Do you just mean subscri you subscribe to Windows and you just get every version automatically? Right. Yeah, subscription. Yeah. So, so yeah. like software yeah. assurance, kind yeah. of. Like, well, like it's thirty nine ninety nine a year, and it's Windows three sixty five, and you just keep getting the. It just keeps updating you. I'm I'm, I'm using Office three sixty five. I love it. Yeah, me too. We all do. I think. Yeah. Well, imagine if, uh, you know, if you, uh, it's like, imagine it, people who pay for a SkyDrive subscription now, or, you know, for the extra storage beyond the seven gigabytes that you get for free. So imagine if, so you're, if you're paying for that now, imagine if you said, well, you know, uh, the, off the Windows subscription includes 
this you know a premium outlook.com subscription and uh, 50 or 100 gigabytes of SkyDrive storage and or whatever they call it and <laughs> uh, and something and and some other service oriented benefits that you have uh, Xbox Live subscription the music stuff you know it becomes a bundle there and you just and you never have to pay for uh, an a la carte subscription or an a la carte upgrade again you know it's interesting microsoft has clearly wanted to do this for years but right. the market wasn't ready for it and i think that uh you know when you just what you just described that sounds great to me Maybe, yeah i'd buy it yeah it seems like the market i'm an amazon prime user and i amazon's been slowly putting more and more things on their what you get for prime oh prime you want to get windows for prime okay all <laughs> prime subscribers get a free copy of windows and a subscription to the washington post it's great <laughs> Why wouldn't you do it? Double bonus. <laughs> and, and, and the and the wound socket gazette or whatever. Did he also get the wound socket gazette? Man, that was my daily read when I lived in Providence. Yeah. No. Um yeah, I so maybe that's what Windows I mean we've we've been yeah. kind of hinting around that that might be what Windows 9 really is, is uh Windows Maybe 9. it won't be called Windows 9, maybe we yeah. call it Windows yeah. 365. 365, yeah. yeah. I think the world's ready for that. Is enterprise right. ready for that, Mary Jo? Is that something? I mean, they're they're already doing it with assurance. Yeah, I, yeah. I think if you positioned it that way and said, "Hey, you know, we're going to phase out software assurance, and then we're just going to call it this Windows 365 mm -hmm, thing instead." Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Windows the, 365 the, business, just like they do with right, Office. Right. I mean, I, I'll be curious if like SMB customers, small mid sized business customers, want it. But you know, they're they're interested in Office 365, so they're I could see them also understanding that model and going with it. I wonder what the uptake is on Office 365 in the for consumers, not business. Well, we know what it is. Yeah, we do. It's good. It's good. It's good. People <laughs> like it. It was uh, one million. They sold one million subscriptions to, of uh, Office 365 Home Premium in the first hundred days it was available. And how does that compare to normal Office sales? Was it one million or a hundred million? No. What? Do you remember? Can't it? be a hundred million. No, it can't be a well, hundred. Well, it could be. Yeah. No, it was. It was. It was. It was one million, which is one a, million. Which yeah, is a I'm like, wait, yeah, it's okay. a decent yeah. number. It is. I yeah. mean, and they and they pointed out, you know, if you look at if you compare that to other um, services that are out there now, like Dropbox and other kinds oh, of things, huge. they 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 got to a million pretty quickly. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, there were a lot of doubters when they first came out with Office 365 Home Premium saying, uh, consumers don't want to buy things on a subscription. They want to buy software in a box. They, that's right. what they know and love. But this is kind of showing people are open to it. No, I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you get yeah. a new PC or whatever. I get one of the first things like, oh, crap. I, do I have to buy Office again? Right. For yeah. it, like $300. Like, I, I would like to just be able to log, log into in. my Office, you yeah. know, my hotmail account or whatever yeah. and and there it is and i just t say oh computer you no longer have a license new computer there it is press button install and be That's done what app stores have conditioned us to uh it is it frankly uh because we i mean the world's changed we have bandwidth we're used to streaming media we don't buy physical media as much the world is moving away from discs to, to downloads Oh yeah, I mean, look how lazy we've become on our own our music and, right. and movies, right? I, mean, I used to anymore. spend crazy amounts of time backing up my stuff to DVDs. Now it's like, oh, well, okay. I, I just, you know, I load up iTunes and I, you know, there Download it is. Again. There's all my yeah. songs. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I think maybe the, the time Microsoft yeah. has long wanted this, and the time is ripe now for yep. subscription version of Windows. I bet you this is the last time they do it this way. Yeah. yeah, it it is. Uh, it is, however, uh, there's a, a a shift that has to happen in in the minds of consumers who just instinctively feel yes. that with a subscription they're going to oh, no. they're they're losing something. Yeah. And, you know, it's I mean, when you sit down. You know, I sit down and explain to someone what you get with it, uh, and it's a great deal. The only people it's not a good deal for are the cheapskates who want to buy. I know, want an eighty dollar uh, copy I, of Word. Well, I want Office 2003, and I never want to ever buy Office again. Well, they don't have you know? to, do they? They don't have to. Uh, <laughs> they have to buy Windows also, again. But remember, it's also not we, a good deal for me. Most people don't buy Windows standalone. They buy a new PC. Right. Right. So why is it not right. a good it's deal also, for you? It's not a good deal for me because um, I'm, again, a very unusual user. I have one PC that I want to run Office on. So if you only have one that you want to run it on, it's actually 
like you could you could make a case yeah, and yeah. you don't want to put it on multiple PCs or right. Macs or right. you don't want to have, you know, multiple iPhones or Android phones c and connecting in and using uh, Office Work uh, Office Mobile on that. So if you're just somebody who just uses Office very bare bones, one, you know, I I barely ever use Word, Excel, PowerPoint yeah. anymore. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but how I can often use do you upgrade apps. your machine? Uh, I only upgrade my machines uh, probably every three to four years. Okay, well, let's say three years. What do you do yeah. with the old copy? Do you buy a new three hundred dollar copy of uh, Office then? Yeah. yeah, I. You know what? I I hate to admit this, but I will. I I am using Office less and less and less. She uses um, uh, Notepad, Brad. Uh, I use Notepad. Um, <laughs> just I do, really. <laughs> I do, and I, I also. Hear VI you know, is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and Office free. web apps, Office web apps do mostly what I need to do right. um, because I am not a power user of things like Excel, and I know that you know for businesses that's not the case. But for somebody like me, I, I'm not a power Excel user. Barely ever use PowerPoint. I make very few PowerPoints. Um, Word, I don't really need. And OneNote, I can just use, uh, you know, like the web app version. This begs the question well, heck, why people, Live Writer. well, or why people like Mary Jo don't use uh, Open Office or LibreOffice, a free yeah. office. Because I it's guess cause, awful. Oh. Yeah, and also, <laughs> also because the, the formatting, the formatting gets lost if you use that. Still, it's not a hundred percent right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chat room's gonna it's, go crazy. It, gonna it's go crazy. far are. from it's far from a hundred percent. It's you know, if you like Open Office or LibreOffice. God bless you. But she's using uh, Notepad, right? So it's not well, like she's so, using. So a this is a this is a rant that I've been wanting to do. But I've been meaning to write this column for a while. Virtually everyone who reviews software these days is a professional writer. Right. And all professional right. writers ever use is the WordPress <laughs> composing window. And, yep. and so, and, and so. That's but, why Notepad's fine. In fact, that's I, why Notepad, yeah. That's why Notepad's fine. So most people, right. you know, it just, or, or Evernote or, right. you know, something. Right. It's yeah. basically Plain a, a repository for yeah. text and links. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, but, but most people, most families that I know, Kids who go to school right, right. use PowerPoint. They do use PowerPoint. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Kid, That's right. Uh, uh, kids in college and people in business who use one uh, who use OneNote love OneNote. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, they like it. Many of them like it more than Evernote. Some people like Evernote more than OneNote, especially if they're cross -platform. in the Android. Yeah, if you're a cross community. Yeah, they, guy, yeah, if they if they're primarily Android and uh, and OS X, then right. then great. Uh, but uh, and Excel uh, is, you know, amazingly powerful tool for a whole bunch of things, uh, you know. But but if all you ever read are reviews from professional writers, <laughs> now. right, right. That's like Who, asking the guys at Consumer Reports to recommend makeup. Exactly. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or shaping products. Or, yeah. right. I used I used to buy the shampoo recommended. By Consumer Reports, and, and my ex-wife said, "What are you crazy? These guys wash their hair with soap. You're talking to the wrong <laughs> people. <laughs> they say they're all the same, honey. Yeah, of course they do. They're using Dial to wash their hair. <laughs> so this is the me. equivalent. Yeah, exactly. This is the equivalent. You guys, right. you writer That's why types. I always say I'm not. I I am not the typical user. I yeah. am not. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Uh, I love this. This is so much fun. We got forget that Therot guy. <laughs> oh, he'd be on here telling he'd you that. He'd be just as fun. He, with 512K of RAM is enough. All you need for 4,096 <laughs> colors and multitasking. No, 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 no. But we I do. We need to find a topic to be grumpy about. Yeah, we know, need. So, so, we can, so we can channel the spirit. That's the missing piece is the Eeyore. We don't have an Eeyore oh, we, here. <laughs> Yeah. Now, if we had him on the F for Xbox One, right? <laughs> hey, you saw Larry Herb's uh, little. Uh, uh, it's the strangest thing to see an unboxing. Of the Xbox One from Microsoft, but okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's can I get one now? Does that mean it's available? No. Because no. I see an unboxing, it usually implies I can you know, yeah, purchase no. Not even close. a device. My Amazon says December 5th. I uh, see. Yeah, but Amazon's must have off a special in at Microsoft then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how does that Major Nelson get these things? <laughs> I just don't understand. He must be on some list. He must be. Um, Let's take a break. We'll come back with more. But I, I'm, I'm having fun with this panel. Uh, it's okay. great to have Brad on, Brad Wardell, who is a legend as far as I'm concerned. I've been using ah. Stardock since uh, we in, met in uh, Screensavers days uh, and recommended it highly for, that must have been Windows 95. 
Yeah, I don't remember what it was. Might have been NT. Windows NT. NT. Could be. Could <laughs> New be. technology. Could be. But Stardock's still going great. Now you got a games division, and uh, you're doing a lot of stuff, uh, which is really exciting. It's nice to have you on, Brad. Uh, Thanks. His personal uh, website um, is tiny, little tiny, what is it? LittleTinyFrogs.com. Little tiny what yeah. does that mean? Oh, it's just where I put all of my I, my handle on the internet, which is an unfortunate thing, is Frog Boy, which I oh, chose dear. back when back when I was on BBS days. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know that happens. Yeah, we have people in the chat room with the worst handles, and they say I can't change it. I've been using it since 1992. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's how Stardock got its name. Oh my God! I mean, back it was. You know, 20 years ago, and I was building uh, PCs, and they asked me what the name of my company was, and I, I thought, oh my God, I don't have a company. I, and I, the title of a book I was reading, not the title, but a chapter of a book was Stardock. No. So I just said, uh, Stardock no. Systems. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. That's hysterical. I and know, are you and it's just like I always said, oh, if I could have just named the company something clever or, or, or something, and then... Twenty years later, here we are. It's still Stardock. Stardock's <laughs> an actually a great name. You chose well. Anyway, it's great to have you. <laughs> it's great to have you, Brad. Also from ZDNet, of course, the great Ed Bot, a legend in the business. I, Ed and I used to do, uh, do uh, Dvorak on computers, the radio show, in in like ninety one, ninety two. Yeah. Um, back in the day. Back in the day, DOS three point three, baby. Taking I, support calls from readers. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty funny because you know. It, it, like in 94, well, I've heard this thing called the Internet, but all I have is a dial-up connection. Oh, yeah, you need a slip connection, not a PPP connection. We could, or we could, turn your, we could turn your PPP into a slip connection. Was it like Echo? What was it called? Echo Wait, we can get you a shell account. Shell account. Well. Yeah, you, that was what it was. You could turn a shell account into a slip account, but you had to ride this weird, funky software. Those are the days. Yeah, <laughs> I still get chills whenever I hear somebody say IRQ request. I, interrupt, interrupt request. IRQ conflict. Oh, that's is, is IRQ five free? <laughs> you, know, you want to try seven? And then the even IRQs and the odd IRQs shared interrupts, so you couldn't. If you had five, you couldn't use seven. Well, it depends what COM port two is using. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, the good, uh, good old days. <laughs> oh, Ed's gone. <laughs> yeah, next is QAM 386 and RAM parameters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Memory managers. Yeah, baby. It's We're gonna, gonna be flashbacks now. I gotta go take some Xanax. I know. It's like a bad it's like a bad acid <laughs> wash trip. It, wash it down with some shoof. What interrupt <laughs> every once in a while somebody calls the radio show says, I'm getting an interrupt conflict. <laughs> what? When, no where did you way. get that PC? <laughs> no, people no, it's it's not at all unusual. The people in the world who have fifteen year old PCs is completely common. And they want to and they want to get on the internet. I get one of the big questions I get is my how my fax modem <laughs> <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> it's 19,200 baud. That seems fast. It's connecting at 26,400. You don't understand. Oh. Ah, the good old days. Our show today brought to you uh, by something a little more modern, squarespace.com. If you are still using the WordPress edit form to post your, to your blog, you might want to get a little more modern. Squarespace is so... Awesome. It's it's hosting plus a content management system tightly integrated to give you literally the best place to put your website. The templates, the styles that are available are fabulous. You cannot bring Squarespace hosting down. And uh, and if you want to do e-commerce now, they've got e-commerce, which is fabulous. Take a look. It's actually really easy to get a sense of what Squarespace can do for you because if you go to squarespace.com and click the Get Started button, you can use it completely free you don't even need to give them a credit card for two weeks sometimes that's enough for a site you know you got a, a, par a party coming up you got a wedding coming up you know make your site and just and use it for two weeks and then let it shut down but if you want to keep it going it is the most affordable way to do it including e-commerce let me just go to the pricing menu but i do invite you to go and get started and just try it you don't need to use our offer code or a credit card or anything it's just free for two weeks when you decide to buy there's three plans they made it very simple there's the standard plan the unlimited plan and the business plan business is only if you want to do e-commerce but i gotta tell you 24 bucks a month includes everything 
when you pay the uh, you pay annually it includes everything including an, a beautiful e-commerce system fully integrated there are no transaction fees from squarespace the, you know your credit card people might but they set you up by the way with a merchant account and everything unlimited physical or digital products you get a beautiful mobile store as always with squarespace all their sites are mobile responsive design so they look great no matter what size screen from 27 inches to 4 inches or even smaller if you've got a blackberry they have inventory tracking. They'll do the tax, shipping. You can even do coupons. And like the unlimited plan, you get unlimited bandwidth, unlimited storage, unlimited contributors, unlimited pages, galleries, and blogs. You know, I think I think of Squarespace as kind of the place, if you were going to start the next, you know, Vox Media, go to Squarespace and do it. Why not? You can, uh, there's some of the cool things. You can uh, 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 use these uh, designs to do uh, portfolios if you're an artist uh, that just looks spectacular. And what's nice about the templates, they're always unique. I, you know what? I would like to check out some of the sites you built with Squarespace. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask you to tweet out uh, your Squarespace site. You can do it now. We'll use the hashtag Windows Weekly Squarespace. If you've got a great Squarespace site, you're proud of it, you'd like a little extra publicity, what we'll do if you tweet out with the hashtag Windows Weekly Squarespace, I know that's a lot of letters, but do include the URL, okay? Just You could say, like, look at mine, the URL, hashtag Windows Weekly Squarespace. And in future uh, shows, we'll highlight some of those. Because um, I love seeing what you're doing with Squarespace. If you're not using Squarespace, try it free. If you decide you want to buy, we're going to get you 10% off your first purchase on new accounts when you use our offer code Windows and the number 8. This does not mean Windows 8. This means Windows in the, in the 8th month, August. Because I don't want you to get all excited next month when we say Windows 9. It's Windows and 8 for August. That's the offer code. Squarespace.com. Windows Weekly on the air. Paul Therat taking the day. Did he tell you, Mary Jo, what he's up to? Is he is he doing something fun, yeah. I hope? You know what? He's told me he hasn't taken a true vacation, like with yeah. no working, for Good. 10 years. Yeah, because he's always writing. Yeah. His book is done right. now, right? His book is done. The phone book's done. And yeah, so he said, you know what? I'm going to take a real week off. That's great. I know. Not do yep. the show or anything. Good for you, Paul. I, I hope he's not. He needed one, at least one real week off. Yeah. <laughs> do, do we get to do it? Do we get to do it? The jerk reference here. Sure. The new phone book is here. The new phone book is here. <laughs> <laughs> it is literally the Windows phone book. Yeah. It's important you say phone book, not phone book. Um, yeah, I, and I guess is he gonna? I, well, we'll have to ask next week. But uh, if you go to WindowsPhoneBook.com, you can read it and, and all that. Yeah. Yup, in the chat room says, oh, he just probably got hired by Google. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, that's it. <laughs> Working right alongside M.G. Sigler there. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. Is Sigler, uh, did he go to Google Ventures? He's Google Ventures. He yep. left TechCrunch and went to Google Ventures. Huh? I don't know. I think he's, wow. still at, he's still at both, but he's, uh, he's, he's throwing money around for Google Ventures. Okay. Yep. It should be nicer. We'll do it. <laughs> hey, speaking of Google, um, what? so I think it was a little bit of a tempest in a teapot, but uh, um, a lot of people wrote about it. I don't know if you wrote about it, Ed. Uh, this issue with Chrome passwords. If you go into Chrome, you can uh, go and easily see your uh, passwords. They're shown with dots, but there's a show button. You can see them. Uh, and uh, somebody uh, wrote a blog post about this. The Verge and others picked it up saying, oh, my God, you can see the passwords in Chrome. Uh, it is different in other browsers. I'm wondering what how Internet Explorer handles stored passwords. So, so I did write about that. Uh, so, and so Internet Explorer and Safari both have, and Brad, you probably know about this. They they both have system level services that are right. accessible through APIs that can store secrets like this because so, they're it, written by the operating system creator. Exactly. Right. Well, Apple no, or Microsoft. Chrome, Chrome could use these APIs. Oh, they Chrome could. could okay. use the, Chrome could use the Keychain API on uh, OS 10, and it could use the Protected Storage API on Windows 7 and later. And in those cases, if you, so, from Internet Explorer or Safari on a Mac, if you save uh, your credentials for a website, it goes into a location that is. Right. Uh, Encrypted sure. by the operating system, right. and if you and if you try to view those passwords in uh, in Windows Seven or Windows Eight with the Web Credentials Manager, you first have to supply your credentials, 
your, your password or in my case a fingerprint i think uh, chrome should do this on the other hand they make the point that look if you if you've got somebody with physical access to your computer fully logged in you've got many other worries besides them looking for your passwords they could just go facebook.com and chances are they're in well, and, and fine they but they can't but with uh, with the ability to see your passwords in plain text they could write down if you've saved your bank's password there right. they could write your password down in a matter of seconds clear that tab True. and there's no audit trail there's True. nothing to indicate that the the uh the director of security I... for chrome said you know that this is uh, it's it's false security. If somebody has access to your system logged in, they have access to you everything. You got bigger anyway. problems, yeah. And you and you do have bigger problems, but layered security is important. And, and I guess the other point would be that Chrome, unlike Explorer and Safari, is needs to be cross-platform. I, for instance, sync my Chrome passwords to all my devices. So if they're using right. a proprietary OS store on Windows, I mean, they could do it. But it would take a, a not insignificant amount of programming to. It would take it. It would take a relatively trivial amount of programming really? to do it. I, I think. But as soon as yeah, the browser, but if the browser has the capability to unencrypt and and it has to have this ability to unencrypt and display the passwords, otherwise it can't send them to the websites. Right. Um, then, it's an API. It, it's it's an API. No, call. I understand. If you're using Windows, it's an API call. But then you have to go to a Safari and you have to make a different API call. It's going to be in memory. As a practical matter, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a tempest in a teapot. I mean, if you get someone who's technically savvy, I could, I could, if I have access to your PC, I could install something that would hook that API right. and de-encrypt it. Your I could host, have all your no stuff. What. So yeah. it's, but, but on the other hand, it is, seems like a gratuitously lazy thing. I'm, they could I'm do it. And they probably should do it. do it. Yeah, they probably should do it. Yeah. And they've been saying for five years, this is, this is not a new feature. Right. This, this has been, this has been going on for years. Well, Firefox did it for years too. In fact, Firefox did worse. They stored the passwords in, in clear text, unless you used a, a uh, an authorization but, password, and they still have the yeah. You know, Firefox has the master password. Master password, option. yeah, yeah. But I think this is this is something that that Chrome could that Google could fix right. and should fix so easily. There should be an option uh, for for people to uh, and to encrypt this because, like, their Dan position said, is is password password stored by the browser is inherently a bad idea. If you've turned on pa stored passwords then you've really given people the keys to the kingdom. And that's why I use LastPass. I don't have the browser store. The so password. if it's inherently a bad idea, then remove the feature. Remove the feature, But, yeah. but Chrome puts it in your face. In, in my article that I wrote this week, right. uh, you know, I, I showed, there's a little dialogue box that comes up. The first time and every time you log on to a website with credentials, it says, would you like Chrome to save? Would you know Chrome? Hey, we'll save this for right. you so that it can sync to everything that you've right. you've got here. If it's a bad idea, then don't, then don't, don't encourage save it. it. <laughs> and don't forget, if you say no, it'll ask you again next time. You can't you, you can't check too. the box. Don't ask you, me again. You can you can uh, check the box, and you can also go into the settings and right. and say you don't want it to ever store passwords. But in the article that I wrote, this is really an issue of physical access. And so, first of all, you should never give someone access to your logged in desktop. That's right. what guest accounts are for. Right. And right. and every modern operating system except iOS has the concept of a guest account. Right. Uh, and it takes a matter of about three clicks to set up a guest account. Somebody wants to borrow your computer, just a second, click, 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 here, go, go nuts. Mm -hmm. And you have no access to any of my stuff. All these you know. browsers and all, all many, many websites do say, hey, if you're on a shared system or somebody else is using your system, you should be, you know, you shouldn't check the box, always log in. And, but people, if you're on a system by yourself and nobody has physical access to it, these are conveniences that are inherently insecure. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that it's Google's responsibility to secure our systems. If, you've, if you're leaving your system, I mean, when I walk away from my system, it locks as it should for everybody who is in a in the office or somewhere where others can sit down at your computer. So here's so what Brad said was if you're technically sophisticated and you have access to somebody's unlocked right. Tim Berners-Lee said it's the it's the sister's password problem.
Exactly. That's <laughs> and that's the thing is I don't need to be technically sophisticated right. to go and and steal your password. I mean, this is this is a prank thing right. that 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 people can do. And so imagine, you know, college dorm, you know, somebody walks away from their computer, you go over and you check their you get their Facebook password and then you start signing them up for, you know, Justin Bieber fan newsletters. You know, <laughs> and, you're and, never gonna let me live that down. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's a great singer. Don't knock him, okay? Uh, all right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess that's the and it is a somewhat flimsy response from uh, the Chrome guys. Is well, we don't want to give people a false sense of security. It was tone deaf, is what it was. It's tone yeah. deaf. Yeah, that's, that's probably the best. That's way to the describe it. the real issue is that it was tone deaf. Right. They're they're not responding. It, it's. To me, it is exactly as tone deaf as Microsoft's response a year ago right. to the initial complaints about the start menu. Right, right. Yeah. I didn't know that Google was hiring Microsoft's PR people. I mean, now <laughs> we know. <laughs> They're I would bet Microsoft's PR people from ten years ago. I'm willing. Just, I'm willing to bet that uh, they're working on exactly what you just described, which is having a secure store. Um, maybe they've been saying they. they this is not the first time that people have brought this up to them. Oh, it's been around as long as I've used Chrome. This is not and an unusual feature. And yeah. people have complained about this before. And uh, they they might just go all stubborn engineer on, on us and right. say, no, we, we believe this is the correct engineering decision. Right. And uh, CR1 and makes an apt point. You lock your door even though... If somebody's determined, locking the door is not going to stop them. But it is a way of saying, hey, I prefer that you not walk into my house. Uh, a commenter on my post, I uh, think, came up with the best analogy of all. Uh, I have a home office. It has uh, it has a safe in it yeah. where I put valuable things, and it also has a locking desk drawer so that someone can't come, so, so that right. someone who's a guest at my house for a party, right. a house sitter, whatever, can't come in and rifle through my right. you know credit card statements and stuff. And and. Uh, so there's that's the same analogy. I could let someone borrow my house, but I don't want them to have access to every single thing in my house. Right. I consider that a uh, a commitment there to let people borrow your house. So uh, <laughs> just let me know <laughs> when you're when hey, you're gonna be out of you're, town. You're gonna have to take the dogs for a walk every day. Air, uh, Airbnb Santa Fe. It says Ed Bot's <laughs> house right there, right on the front. <laughs> uh, let's get a quick Windows Phone uh, update. We also have some Xbox uh, news. Uh, according to IDC, Windows Phone is now 3.7% penetration. Woo. That's just a little bit in, but hey, it's in. It's in. We are the 3.7%. <laughs> That's my new oh, shirt. Speak for yourself. I have an iPhone. <laughs> oh, Brad. Brad. You're, you're missing a, a distinct opportunity, <laughs> a commercial opportunity here. Brad. Um, yeah, so they came out with their new, uh, IDC came out with their new shipment numbers. This is... Uh, Q2 2013 unit shipments. Uh, so we we are the 3.7 percent up up pretty significantly. Uh, ch change year over year is 77 percent. So you know, even though that's a small percentage, that's it's, that's good no. news. And do you think the 1020 will change that a little bit? I know a lot of people who are actually looking at the uh, Nokia 1020 because it's such a good, such a better than you know, head and shoulders better than anything else camera phone, yeah. and saying I'll bite the bullet on Windows Phone. Yeah. I think I think it'll help. I think where they're really going to get a lot more traction is in developing markets for Windows Phone. Um, you know, the, the 1020 is a really great phone, and I think it's still kind of a niche phone. Yeah. And I, it's also a flagship phone and more expensive. Right. And where, 300 where, bucks, at, yeah. Yeah. If you look at where Microsoft's really gaining momentum, it's in the developing world and at, with Nokia doing the mid-lower range phones. So that's, that's where I think they're going to really take it over i think we can agree the real issue is apps i mean when people yeah. and in fact even for me when i because i'd love to 10 20 but mm -hmm. i just you know i gotta have the apps that i i need and use i was thinking the other night i don't do really that much with my phone 99 percent of what i do with my phone is text messaging um taking and taking pictures both of yeah. which windows phone can do very competently That's great right <laughs> um yeah. so it's really those one percent apps that you need, although if you're an Instagram user, despite the right. third-party Instagram apps, you might very reasonably say, "Well, I can't buy Windows Phone." If you're a Path user, I know it's coming, but it's not there yet. So, what is? But Microsoft's or doing Facebook. 
right? There's no, is, I don't think there's still, there's still not a, a dedicated Facebook. In my opinion, there. that's an advantage, but uh, there are many, you're right. Who, <laughs> seriously. Mic Microsoft's building one. I have, a, I have an Android phone where uh, you can't, I can't remember which one it is, but you can't erase the Facebook app. And I find that oh, so geez. frustrating. You know, it's part of yeah. the build. Yeah. I find that so frustrating. Yeah, uh, I thought. Wait, Android's open. I I assume that. <laughs> well, you'd have to. You ha you could root it and get rid of it. Absolutely, yeah. but uh, but the yeah. part of the, and it's probably not the manufacturer. Probably the carrier's build has Facebook on it. I think it's the HTC One from AT and T has Facebook baked in. It's very yeah. frustrating because Facebook's a notorious battery drain. Mm -hmm. um, so they're they're gonna Microsoft's got a new um, tool for non programmers. Yeah. Yeah, they've got this new thing called, uh, I don't know if either of you guys have played with it, uh, Brad or Ed, but it's called the Windows Phone App Studio. So it's a <laughs> very funny. simply, very simple template-based tool. And the idea is there are all these people out there, ho they're hoping, who have all these great ideas for Windows Phone apps, but they aren't programmers. So this just lets you plug a lot of things in, and, and then you're going to have the option to either make it a private app, you know, something you just share with your family or your neighborhood oh, or your nice. building. Or you can get it approved and put it in the Windows Phone store. Uh, so people are starting to tinker with it. It just got announced this week. It's a brand new tool. It's not based on anything else that they've done before. So I, I'm going to be curious what kind of apps come out of this. I mean, this isn't the tool that for building Facebook and or something really complicated. It's a tool for building those kind of apps that we're missing a lot of on Windows Phone, which are these very localized um specific apps that people say, I have this on Android and I have right. this on iPhone and there's not one like this on Windows Phone. Yeah, the, you know, the problem is, is that, I mean, as a developer, as someone who writes software and sells to make money, uh, the, Windows, the Windows Store is a non-starter. I mean, it is so bad. Uh -huh. I mean, compared to what's available on Android or, or iOS that it's just, it's really hard to find apps. It's really hard to differentiate your app compared to other things. Um, they just, Microsoft re needs to completely redesign the store if they want to get more developers over there. So because I, if I make an app, I have really no opportunity to, to promote it at, on the store. There's no, I mean, the spotlight stuff on there is very limited. Uh, if you compare that going to the iOS store, it's, it's much more... Uh, but Apple decides how it experience. gets promoted, right? So you're kind of still in Apple's pocket. Of course, if you get promoted, uh, the sky's the limit. You can actually do really, really well, but you've got to get promoted. And there are a lot of developers in the Apple store who say, well, I never get promoted, so I'm never going anywhere. Well, sure. But even beyond that, I mean, if you look at the Windows Store and you just do a search, you get, you're get you bombarded with endless numbers of Id almost identical rectangles. That, yeah, that's that, true. You know, and it, it's that's just really yeah. hard to look yeah. through and... and not, not discovery is, is a challenge as well. Yeah. It's yeah, it's discoverability is just yeah. terrible. Brad, have you seen the the store redesign for Windows eight point one? I have not. I hope oh, it's a lot better. Okay, it's uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. light years, oh, light good. years yeah. better. In, it in a response to this, it, it, uh, it completely in response to to this. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah, yeah. You you should take a look at that. Uh, they, they still have work to do, but. Uh, and the discoverability is always going to be an issue. That's an issue with iOS also. The, the thing is that you've got enough ratings and enough uh, high-quality apps that that when you go to a category, there's likely to be something that will float to the top and be good, whereas there well, still aren't very many of those. They have, an, they have like what's hot. They have editor's picks. They have different Charts. venues for... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's just a lot more... There's a lot more opportunity for your app to get highlighted yeah. uh, on the Apple Store than uh, than what's on Microsoft's. And so, because I, I want to make Windows Phone, the, the tools for making iOS stuff is still pretty terrible compared to what you have available. I mean, Visual Studio is still a wonderful development environment, but I have to be able to make money on what I, I write. Right. Infragistics uh, has an article which uh, one of you linked uh, to here. Yeah, I did. Uh, the yeah. top 100 apps and uh, and their availability on the four platforms, because we're going to include Windows 8 as one of the platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really awesome chart um, that one of Microsoft's MVPs and uh, a developer at Infragistics did, Nick Landry. 
he he took a look at a hundred self-selected mobile apps, and you know he picked all the big names pretty right. much, and he said, which of these are available on which platforms? And he did this because he said, I'm sick of people saying nothing's available on Windows Phone. And right. so if you look at this chart, there are a lot of things that are not on Windows Phone and Windows 8. It's true. That's the but red he, boxes you're saying. Those are the red boxes, yeah. And he he wanted to show like what kinds of apps are these and. Uh, what which ones are and aren't available and he made quite some quite interesting notes about the list like why are they missing the apps and uh he talked about banking apps and all that so it's it's definitely worth reading if you're somebody who wants to understand uh why even though we have 160,000 windows phone apps now um we're still missing some of these key apps right Good post. Good good job. A lot of work. And he said he's going to keep yeah. updating this chart. So if you're somebody who's thinking about getting Windows Phone and you're like, oh, I wonder if this app's on there, you should go check this chart out uh, before you buy. You make a good point. Banking app is pretty critical. Yeah, um, it is. A I lot don't of use my are, banking. I have B of A and yeah. USAA as a bank, mm -hmm. so I don't use them all the time, but I do need to have them. Yeah, well, Wells Fargo just got their app uh, this week on Windows Phone, so yeah. that was a new addition this week, which is good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And one of the interesting things about that chart that I found, uh, and I agree, it's a great, uh, amazing piece of work and valuable, and I do hope he keeps keeps updating it. It ties into my mistakes that Microsoft made with Windows 8 post. Uh, one of the things about Windows 8 is that developers could say, oh, well, we don't need to do a Windows 8 app. We have a, a Windows desktop app or a web app and it will work just fine on Windows 8, so we can push that one off till till later. Uh, and and that was, you know, they could just tell their users, go get our desktop app. Right, right. Yeah. Or our HTML5 app, right? I mean, can you, uh, in right. many of these cases, you could, you know, if they had an HTML5 app, you could use those. Right, or you know, in some cases, they even have older Flash apps uh, <laughs> that, that work, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh. Um, so there's two ways, you know, there's, there's really two ways Microsoft can do this. One is pay developers and they have done this in some very notable uh, cases, yeah. uh, but they have, don't they have good developers in team in house? You, you wrote an, uh, um, article, Mary Jo on the Bing team doing yep. four new apps. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's, that was really great to see. That was a rumored thing that the, People who are in this Bing AppX team, as it's called, there's like 200 developers in Bing whose job it is to build uh, mobile apps. And they built the finance and the weather and the stock and the sports and travel apps that a lot of people really like on Windows 8. Yes, they're beautiful. Um, they're They've beautiful. even staffed them in the case of the news app. They've got a news yeah. department. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> So they, they uh, have ported four of those apps over to Windows Phone and they announced uh, and put those in the store this week. Uh, so it's the same team doing it. They just did a port of those apps over to Windows Phone. How hard is that, How hard is that to do, uh, uh, to port a Windows app, presumably a Metro app or a Windows 8 app, over to the phone? How hard, how hard is that? So I, I can give you an answer and then I'll have the Brad's real the developer. developer. Yeah. yeah. So the answer, the answer I'll give you is I asked the Fresh Paint team this because they recently just did the same. Right, they had a, right. an app on Windows 8 and they moved it to phone awesome and they app. claimed it was really easy. They hmm. said they could reuse a lot of their code. You know, you have to take a, a, into consideration the difference in screen size right. and how you'd be using the app. But um, they claimed it took one guy just like a matter of a couple days and he wasn't even full time on it, I right. think. Uh, so, you know, then there has to be all the testing and they, and they wanted to add some new features in as well. So he was doing that too. But uh, Microsoft thinks that there can be a lot of code reuse and I, I haven't had a chance to talk to the Bing AppX team, but I would think they reused quite a bit of their code as well because the, the Windows 8 app was built in HTML JavaScript. So that hopefully could have helped them a little bit. So Brad, why isn't uh, why aren't all those great games on Stardock uh, ported over? <laughs> well, on one of the phone? most bizarre things is that they uh, WinRT does has limited support for DirectX, and uh, so, so I games are out. Windows game, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, it's it's kind of bizarre that they. I know people who wanted to work with Microsoft on making WinRT more game centric. And uh, Microsoft wanted to do their own thing with WinRT. That's so a shame because that's what you're seeing with the iPad is this is a 
this is a game platform that right. you know a big part of iPad uptake in my opinion is gaming they need to make it so that RT apps work on the Xbox one I mean it should that if I write an RT app make it available in the Xbox one store and I think they would get a lot of to me that seems like a no-brainer I don't know I have I've not heard that they're gonna do that but doesn't that seem like something they should do yeah Phone or Xbox. So what? So are you? Uh, what is your? Are you doing Xbox One games? Are you going to do some? You know, it, 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 they've changed their policy so many times. Indie developers are disadvantaged, aren't they? Somewhat. Well, not so much. I mean, the main problem is is that they want games at retail still, and we're not willing to do uh, retail games you want to anymore. We got out of retail, right. we, and we're never going back in if we can avoid it. Right. Uh, I can make a PlayStation. For game and I can sell that digitally. Microsoft, right. it's still iffy on whether I can make a game and put it on the Xbox One without having a retail version of it. The At game, the GameStops of the me. world are still really huge for marketing, right? Those long lines out front when the new title comes out, the the pre-reserve, pre-order stuff seems to be a big part of marketing for uh, console gaming still. But that can't be much longer for this world. I expect the game stops to go the same way as the blockbusters eventually, right? Yeah, I think so. It's kind of, it's not, I don't think it's coincidence that uh, Blockbuster and GameStop are both located in Dallas. Yeah. It's anachronistic. It's the same people. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but well, I, there's understand. also the difference, there's the difference between casual gaming. Yes. And, and, uh, and hardcore gaming. The thing about casual gaming, Angry Bird, you know, Angry Birds is on Windows 8, a couple different varieties of it. And, uh, no, it's casual. Microsoft, I agree. Microsoft, but has, we don't make casual games. And I can make, I can make a game that caught with mil, multi million dollar budget, release it on Steam and make Steam's uh, huge. very good margins. Steam's huge. Why can't I do right. that on the yeah. Xbox One? Yeah. There should be, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you should, you Maybe should be, be able, able to, to do that. You will. Wait, we don't, we well, don't well know. the policy last I heard was you. That in order to be on uh, the Xbox uh, Live Arcade or uh, thing, you had to have at least one retail game as well. But you saw there was like a there ratio. Could be new rules. There's there could be new rules that we don't know yet, right? And we're supposed to actually find out more about that at GamerCon. Is that the show this? I week? wouldn't be surprised if Microsoft is hedging its bets on launch. They can, they maintain that rule because they want to keep GameStop in the. In the picture, and they probably sell a lot of units at GameStop. They probably, it's probably a big part of their business, but it's not going to be for very much longer. And I wouldn't, I'd be surprised if they don't change that rule in the first year of Xbox One. Okay. Yeah, I, I would hope so. One, once they allow us to make games that I don't have to go to, I don't want to put my games in boxes anymore. No. I mean, there's a whole bunch of pain in the butt stuff. Well, and don't you lose a lot of the revenue to uh, the, the the distributors and so forth? Oh yeah, I mean. If I make uh, at a, on a retail game, if I make a fifty dollar retail game, at the end of the day, I'm going to end up seeing about twenty dollars of it. Yeah. By contrast, when it's digitally distributed on that fifty dollar game, I'm going to see thirty five of it. That's a big that's difference. A, that's a huge that's difference. A very big difference. Uh, yeah, especially if you sell half a million units, you're talking some money. Yeah, and I mean games. I mean, we've sold millions of copies of games on Steam, and we didn't get on Steam until a couple years ago. I love Steam. Yeah, I really do. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, it's just such a great for the end user. It's a great experience, and it's what we were talking about. The move away from physical media is is happening, like it or not. Yeah, um, I, I can't imagine going to a store at this point and getting a DVD or Blu-ray or whatever the current people do thing is. People, yeah, people yeah, do. exactly. Uh, right, oh, oh, let's go to the store and get a CD. I hear there's a new uh, Madonna. <laughs> Def Leppard, are they still around uh, making CDs? And I yet, mean, people still go to GameStop. Why? I uh, because they have to. You can, have you to. have no choice. Yeah, yeah. Is and it and a, and talking, used, Is it a well, bandwidth used. consideration? Is it uh, Edbot's uh, DSL deprived neighbors? I don't think so. I, I think I mean you don't have a choice. It's co If you want, you don't. I can't go and download the latest, greatest games in general. I don't have the option. I have to go to the store to get it. On on console? On consoles. On PC? On a, P, a PC retail market. Bioshock Steam. Infinite Baby downloaded it, you know, pre-ordered it on Steam, downloaded the minute it was available. And they pre-load it, too. So it's, it's Yeah, there. it was already there. I'm it playing. Better. Yeah. 
I have to think that's. Yeah, got- you see someone with Bioshock Infinite on their Xbox 360, and you go, "Oh my god, this just looks terrible." <laughs> I know. I bought the disc. I I thought <laughs> I want to play it in the living room and in my office, and I never played. I got the PlayStation, but I never played it. <laughs> never played it. Uh, mm-hmm. We did see Larry Winch and Larry Herb, Major Nelson, somehow mm-hmm. got this exclusive, and he's unboxed, <laughs> unboxing <laughs> an Xbox. I don't know how. He, he's he knows people. <laughs> You know, they re- what's hysterical about this video <laughs> is that they actually went to the effort to wrap this stuff, you know, in the in the plastic that it's going to be wrapped in. I can't imagine that it actually came wrapped like that. Not to mention he looks like he's surprised as he... <laughs> <laughs> now, look at this. Oh, my God. Serious? Well, there was you a surprise. You know what's in there. <laughs> there was a surprise. See, they wrap it all and everything. I don't buy that. But there was a surprise, and there, there it is. There's the reveal of the Xbox One. But here is a surprise. It also comes with a headset. They never mentioned that before. Um, Everybody thought that was going to be extra cost. Yeah, right? that's nice. So. Well, we only get one, one controller. I was looking at the headset. That it wasn't clear to me. Is that headset wireless? No, it plug. I think it plugs into the bottom, like the old think ones. About did. that it's though. A mono, mono chat it's been headset. Longest- Headset cable ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it plugs into the bottom of the controller. So yes, oh, it's wireless okay. in that sense. You're right. yes, I believe, oh. and I maybe. And, and somebody pointed out the volume control is on the controller. Yeah. Not on the cord. Right. Which makes it yeah. a little bit more usable. Yeah. See that 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 plug on the bottom of the controller there. That's for the headset. Oh, okay. Yeah, the controller looks awesome to me. Except for the letters, they look like they're hand painted. They look like they, they got a kindergartner oh, and some tempera paint. I'm wondering if this they, really is They might have actually been this, hand painted. This may not be a production model, despite being wrapped. <laughs> it was wrapped. It, it, it looks kind of iOS 7-ish. Ooh, don't say that. You're asking for trouble. Look at the little microphone, the little baby microphone. Wait a minute. That's confusing. Now it's a big microphone. Oh, I see. It's foreshortened. Okay. Because it's big in that picture, and then it shrinks in the other one. So, um... Any any other? I mean, it's pretty. It doesn't look as bad as it looked uh, at the event, where it looked kind of oh. like the monolith from two thousand one. It looked like a really old VCR to me when yeah, it was they really first clunky. <laughs> debuted it. It was really clunky, but it looks good. I w- I, I can't wait. I I, I will get the uh, I got the uh, day one edition or whatever they call it. You know, people don't yet realize the significance of these next this next generation consoles that the graphic difference. It's going to be massive. There's there's two things about these consoles that people hopefully people can remember. One, there's four cores, right? Which means you can have all four cores simultaneously doing rendering, which is gigantic. Four GPU two, cores, right? Yeah. Well, you're right. I mean, you can have multi-core simulation. Um, all your games you're playing, Gears of War, or whatever, are single-core simulations. Uh, four-core simulation means you could have thousands and thousands of guys on the screen wow. at the same time with the, as long as the engine takes advantage right. and two eight gig 64 bit eight gigs of memory mm-hmm. i mean mm-hmm. oh my god mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, remember we were talking bioshock infinite the reason why it looks so crummy on the xbox 360 is because there's no memory you could put texture maps in the memory they have to all be oh yeah they, you can do mega textures with right. this thing which means just uh, it, it, you know, just insane, and they make a big deal that the uh, it supports HDMI uh, 4K, which now the current the current machine won't be able to handle that. But 1080p with uh, four with 56K uh, textures or whatever, it could be just look insane. They they, they made life t- won't look as good as the Xbox <laughs> One. <laughs> It'll be more realistic in the game than in real life. Yeah, you'll be going no outside and conflict. looking at stuff. No and you're like, wow, this is on Candy Valley. <laughs> uh, and it comes with, and they made a big deal about this, a, uh, a 4K HDMI cable. But you're saying, Brad, that it, the machine itself will not be able to pump out 4K video. Uh, it, certainly the games won't be. They won't able be powerful enough. That. Is that a GPU issue? Yeah, the GPUs. Yeah. You, you're, you're, the GPU they have in there won't be powerful enough to do that. We also uh, have learned that uh, if you want to use a DVR functionality, you'll have to be an Xbox Live subscriber at 60 bucks a year. That's not a surprise, though. Yeah. yeah. I, you already have to pay just to get access to... pay to get to Netflix. Netflix. It's, <laughs> Netflix. Yeah. It's like, yeah. come on. I got Netflix free on 100 devices in my house. I got to be... A, it's just nuts. Yeah. yeah. Nuts. That's why, by the way, PlayStation 4 or PlayStation 3 is 
uh, Netflix said the most popular way to watch Netflix. Um, all right, let's. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna get our software picks and uh, a beer in just a moment. Not an actual beer. Darn. <laughs> no, you can have an actual beer in a moment, but those of you watching at home will have to provide your own. Uh, the PBRs are on us. Uh, but we do want to mention our friends at audible.com, a place to go for everybody who loves books or loves to learn or loves to laugh. Audible is the best place. I always say books, but it's really the best place for audio of all kinds. They just added the great courses now, which means you can uh, listen to some of the best college lecturers in the world talking about everything from physics to fine art to music. Uh, Audible is just so great. Of course, thrillers, science fiction, history. Paul and I listen to a lot of history at audible.com. Uh, for listeners of Windows Weekly, we're giving you a free audio book so you can try out the service. This is a way to listen to books on your Windows phone or your or your uh, or any phone. They've got great apps that let you download your whole you know, library can be uh, browsed and downloaded. Whenever I buy another book uh, on the Audible website, it just appears automatically on my phone. I love that. Here's what you do. You go to audible.com slash windows. You'll be signing up for the gold account. That's the most, uh, I think, economical way to get audio books from Audible. Um, that's a book a month subscription for a reduced price. But your first month's free, so you get your first book for free. Cancel any time in the first 30 days, pay nothing, and you get to keep the book forever. Uh, so many great choices. That's the problem. I know... Uh, I know that Paul did not go to Europe without bringing some Stephen King with him. I can't remember which one he's uh, he's listening to, but the nice thing about Audible is there's a lot of Stephen King. The uh, original novel, the inspiration for the show Under the Dome, I know Paul read that and loved it. Uh, Steve Gibson just read it and loved it. Uh, I loved 112263, which is a great time travel novel. The Stand, I'm actually on a Stephen King hiatus, because between this... 112263, which is 31 hours, and The Stand, which is 48 hours. That's 79 hours of Stephen King. I'm pretty much done with Stephen <laughs> King for a while. I, I get a rest. I also listen to the entire Gunslinger trilogy or quadrilogy. or I think there's five books. Anyway, it, there's no lack of great stuff to listen to. That's the beauty of audible.com. So I went from Stephen King uh, to Ernst Becker. Which is kind of quite a quite a shift. His his book Denial of Death is one of the great uh, books of philosophy. <laughs> I don't know, you know, from Stephen King, all about death, to Ernest Becker's Denial of Death. There seems to be a th a theme here. You can get it free. Just go to Audible.com/windows. Pick your first book, and uh, and enjoy. I think you're gonna I think you're gonna love it. Audible.com/windows. We thank them so much for their support of Windows. Weekly, a great panel today. Uh, having a lot of fun. Brad Wardell from uh, Stardock and Little Tiny Frogs. <laughs> dot com. Uh, Ed Bott uh, from ZDNet and uh, his uh, colleague, uh, the wonderful Mary Joe Foley, all here talking about Windows. Let's get our software picks of the week. Who's doing those? You got two people doing them. All right. Brad's going to do one, and Ed's going to do one. All right. Start with you, Brad. All right. Well, uh, I. I one of my hobbies is astronomy. I, I like to uh, look at stuff through telescopes. And there's a great free app called uh, Stellarium. Oh, yeah. And it just came out with a new version this week. And if you haven't tried it, it's free. And all you need to do is uh, you download it and you can see. Now, it's not real useful during the day. You see a lot fewer <laughs> stars during the day. But if you have it on during the night, it, it is, a, especially if you have, say, a Surface uh, Pro, uh, a Surface Pro or something else, like that, you can take it out with you, look up with your telescope, and it makes it a lot easier to find cool stuff. It's so you can uh, see the sky as you point at it and see what's up there. Exactly, it's uh, you you put in your location, and then you can uh, use use your mouse or if it's a touch device, use your you know, your cool. finger, That's cool. and you can then see what's going on in the sky. And I happen to be one of those guys. I like to look at the planets. I like to look at Jupiter and Saturn and that, and. It, being able to just kind of at a glance before I set up the telescope, be able to look up and say, oh, you know what, look, tonight uh, Jupiter is going to be in good, sh you know, in a good place. So I'll go out there and take out my telescope and take a look. And Stellarium is a great uh, tool for that. It's Is it free? Because it's open. I know it's open. There's an open yeah, source it's, version. Yeah, it's free, yeah. open source. That's awesome. Great. 
uh, Stellarium, S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M, and the new 122 just came out. And uh, so does that mean that, uh, oh, yeah, Ed Bott, we know all about Mask Me. <laughs> Ed was on Twitter and talked a lot about Abine. Is yeah. this something new from Abine? This is something new, although they it was in a uh, soft beta before, so so you saw it. Uh, but I couldn't talk about it, uh -huh. uh, and and now I can because it was released about two weeks ago. And what Mask Me from abine.com is uh, an add-in for your browser. Uh, works with Firefox and Chrome right now, coming soon to Internet Explorer and Safari. And in fact, one reason I like this company's products is because they don't ignore Internet Explorer, like so many other add-in makers do who assume that everyone in the world uses Chrome or Firefox. Uh, so they, uh, and Mask Me is a product, you go to a website and you want to do something there and they want your email address. Uh, and then, you know, so you sign up for a webinar or uh, you're as, you know, getting a free ebook or something like that. And you, you need to fill in your email address and then you discover that, uh, that, they start marketing to you and they start marketing and marketing and marketing and then they sell your email address to somebody else and pretty soon you're being annoyed. So what Mask Me does is uh, when you click in the uh, email ad address box, it offers to create uh, a masked email address at a, at a domain called opaque, O-P-A-Y-Q.com that, uh, that then forwards to your real address. And so you sign up for it. Uh, it remembers it for you so that when you go back to that site, you can log in or enter that email address. Uh, and if you start getting marketing annoyances from that company, you could just block the forwards Love from it. it. Love it. Uh, and it's a free service. <laughs> Such a good uh, idea. And there's uh, for $5 a month, you get a, a uh, a much more powerful version of Mask Me that allows you to create a masked phone number mm. as well uh, so that you can give out a phone number and if, if a company starts harassing you or you could give it, you know, you meet somebody at a bar, you can give them that <laughs> phone number. No more 555, five, five, huh? <laughs> yeah, you don't have to get, well, because... <laughs> I have to do that all the time. Because, you know what, if you're, if you're at a bar and you give somebody the wrong, you know, you, you try and give someone a fake phone you number now, they go... Bar again. Well, they well they can pull out their smartphone and they can say, they well, can let me just call it. that oh. right now, so that so that it's in your so that my phone number's in yours mm. and you're busted. And they also have with the with the paid service, you can create masked credit card numbers. <laughs> Last time somebody so, asked me for a phone number, we we didn't have cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, this is all new to me. This yeah, this newfangled we, world. And, and so now some goal. credit cards uh, will let you do a one-time only credit card, but this is not through right. the credit card company. This is through Abine. Right. This is through Abine. So it's a, there's a little, there's a hop, skip, and a jump you have to go through. And they, they uh, Abine manages the process for you. But, uh, but and you and trust a, them, right? I mean, they're not going to harvest my stuff. This is a, this is a privacy company. By, it's a venture-funded venture privacy what company. What a good business. They don't. They don't do anything else but uh, but privacy stuff, uh, and so I do try. I I have met with the uh, uh, the principals of the company, uh, or at least one of one senior member of the company, uh, and spent a lot of time looking at them. They've been around for three years, four years, five years, long enough to uh, you know if they were going to go rogue, it would have happened. So I I do trust them. With all this stuff, though. It is ultimately a matter of you have to trust them. And this is, I think, something like Do Not Track Me and Mask Me are both the kind of products you can you can dip your toe in the water, you can try them out. You're not risking anything, and right. you can see right. whether you like what they do. Their other product, which uh, you showed off on Twitter, Do Not Track Me, uh, is really a great, another great browser extension uh, that you might yeah. want to check out. A-B-I-N-E, A-B-I-N-E, dot. Calm. Thank you, Ed. That's a great recommendation. Uh, let's get our Enterprise Pick of the Week, Mary Jo Foley. Okay. Uh, Enterprise Pick of the Week is Windows Server 2012 R2, which is the blue version of Windows Server 2012. And that product also is in preview right now, uh, but Microsoft quietly has uh, published the sheets that let you see what the pricing and licensing for this is going to be. They just published some 
August 1st, I believe. Um, and there are no huge surprises except for one thing. The data center version of the R2 uh, version of this product has gone up in price by 28% Yikes. over the 2012 version. $6,000. Yeah, at $6,000, uh, the other uh, the 2012 version's in the $4,000 range. Wow. And you know, this is this is the super high-end version of Windows Server. It's the data center version. It lets you have unlimited unlimited VMs running, so you could have unlimited copies of Windows Server running inside the data center. It's very capable. It's it's a very high-end SKU. Uh, but it, it was very surprising that they jacked the price up like that. Um, I asked them why, and, and I just got kind of a vague answer from Microsoft. They said, we're making these changes based on market conditions and the overall increased product value and choice. Um, so, yeah, there, is, there are a lot of new features in Windows Server 2012 R2, uh, especially in the, in the hypervisor arena. But... Uh, the other three SKUs, the standard, the essentials, and the foundation SKU are all exactly the same price as they were with 2012. So if you're somebody who's been using the data center version, you should be aware that um, even though it's going to be a, an easy migration path, you're going to pay a lot more money if you're moving from data center version to data center version. Good to know. Good to know. I guess they figured people who are buying the data center version are not very price sensitive. Yeah, and it, like I said, it is very capable, and you can yeah. run unlimited VMs. So yeah. that yeah, it's, it's a very unreasonable. nice. It's probably asset. economical yeah. even at six thousand dollars. Are there any clues of what the upgrade pricing will be for from uh, two thousand twelve to R two uh, for like yeah. standard and essentials? Uh, no change in pricing. Exactly the same huh. prices. And if, you, if you're if you already running Windows Server 2012, you can continue to use the same CALs if you move to R2, and it's just going to be a free upgrade for you if you're on server. Oh, nice. I'll have to talk to our, our, yeah. our IT guy because we use that uh, pretty heavily for the uh, VMs. Mm -hmm. And because uh, it's just uh, when, when you're trying to run multiplayer games, you set up, uh, you get a data center in Australia and South Africa and Europe, mm -hmm. and then every time someone wants to launch a game, you spin up a VM that wow. is the quote unquote host. So, um, holy cow! I mean, it already is such a good deal in some ways because ten years ago at a data center, you would have been buying individual copies of Windows Server 2003 or, or 2000 or whatever your poison was back in those days, and you'd have 20 of them. So 6,000 for uh, what could be hundreds and hundreds of uh, virtual machines is it's nothing. Wow. Mm -hmm. There you go. Now you know why they raised the price. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. it was yeah. our, it's already such a good it's deal. It's a good deal, yeah. 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 How interesting. So one license and you just got the whole thing. You're done. Yeah, so virtual machines have changed things so much. Oh, I mean, yeah. People forget that. It was, and it just seems like it was not yeah. that long ago, right? That you'd be like, "Oh well, we need to set up a new thing." Well, uh, let me log on to which which server am I logging on to? Oh, oh I need God. to restart IIS because the IIS server oh, is painful. Uh, remember that yeah. back in the screensaver stage? You yeah. guys had to do that all the time, probably. <laughs> yeah, not me, <laughs> not me. Yeah, you, you had people, I had Kevin Rose was the one was doing, doing that. that. Yeah, he was yeah. busy. Yeah, he kept busy. Um, your code name of the week, Mary Jo. Yes. So this is in honor of Edward Snowden. Just kidding. Aww. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what so is it? Now I'm wondering, what could it be? Uh, the code name of the week is Fairfax. And for people who know Virginia, Fairfax, Virginia, oh, um, right next this to code name will make a lot of sense. Yes. Supposedly, you know, right now, if you're a government customer, you can use Windows Azure. There's no problem. And in fact, Microsoft very actively sells Azure to government agencies and government uh, users of all stripes. But I, I'm hearing there could be something like Windows Azure for government coming that is maybe more of a locked down Ooh. version in some way. Uh, ah. it, they have something that's called Office 365 for government, which is very locked down. It, only people who are of American citizenship can work in the data center, and there are all these extra Jeez. controls. It's very, very, very locked down, and, and uh, something that people feel is is not, you know, for people who who care who don't care about ultimate security. It's a it's a dedicated skew of Office 365. So I don't I don't know exactly what Windows Azure for government could be. Uh, but supposedly, whatever it is, the code name is Fairfax. And we will never let that PowerPoint slide <laughs> get out of the uh, get out of exactly. our hands. <laughs> <laughs> they learned their lesson. 
right. finally, we wouldn't be a Windows Weekly without a beer of the week. That's right. Uh, My beer let... pick of the week yes. is called Westbrook White Tie. <laughs> and um, the tie and is T-H-A-I. T-H-A-I. It's a beer that's a wit beer. And, you know, most wit beers are made with orange and coriander. And Ew. they're kind of like, like a blue moon, right? Yeah. But this one is made with lemongrass and ginger instead. Ooh. So if you're eating Asian type wow. cuisine, um, you might like this with that because it really kind of accents the flavors and picks it up. Yeah. And it's even available in cans. It's brewed by uh, this really awesome brewery in South Carolina called Westbrook Brewing. And um, I've had it a couple of times and it's really very good. Best served at 45 degrees and a tulip or <laughs> wine glass. <laughs> White Tie, T H A. White Tie. I yeah. like the name. I know, me too. And right. they have a really cool can. Check the can out. Well, we missed Paul Thorat, but I tell you, if you're going to replace Paul Thorat, I can't think of two better people to do it with. It was so great having you. Mary Jo Foley at allaboutmicrosoft.com. We'll be back next week. I presume yes. Paul will be, unless he enjoyed his vacation so much he's never <laughs> coming back at all. <laughs> or he did get that job at Google we were talking about. Ed Bot uh, is He was there when I was getting uh when I was applying, he was there. He was in line with me. So <laughs> hey, you're working for Google too, huh? Yeah, well it's only a matter of time. <laughs> Everybody will soon. Brad Wardell, Stardoc.com. It's a great place to go if you have Windows 8 and you want a start menu, not a start button. Start eight for five bucks. Great deal. And you offer a trial version of it so people can give it a shot. Uh, and I will highly recommend uh, Modern Mix as well as a way to get your Metro apps in a window. You can still go full screen if you want. It's just a nice little feature. Also five bucks. And there's lots of other things. And great games, too. Uh, Brad's site, littletinyfrogs.com, if you want to visit it or uh, follow him on um, Twitter. What is Dragonall? D-R-A-G-I-O-N. -O oh, God. I, you know, is that a BBS those... handle? It's a BBS handle. <laughs> I know. That's my, I hate that's that. my D and D. I'm a 73 mm. level mage. It, it, we, we call it was uh yeah it was actually champions online but yeah same okay. same thing. All it right. Was, okay. It was, my, it was my D and D handle back in the day. Okay. And, oh man. It had that it had I that know. ring. <laughs> I am I'm a cleric uh, but uh, yeah okay. Thank you, Brad. Level three dwarf lawyer. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> hey, really great to have you on. Thank you, Brad. I hope you come back soon. And I've, we've been a fan of Stardock since, yeah, before the screensavers. So it's good to talk to you again. Ed Bott, good to talk to you again. Just love having oh. you on from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Points West. He's also, of course, uh, regular on the ZDNet. You can find out more about him at edbott.com or follow him on Twitter. Thank you, Ed. It's a pleasure, Leo. Thanks a lot. Great to have you all. We do Windows Weekly every uh, Thursday morning, 11 a.m. Pacific. That's actually uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time or 1900 UTC. So it could be morning, noon, or night. It doesn't, you know, depending on where you live. I hope you'll watch live. We love it if you do. But if you can't, no, don't worry. We make on-demand audio and video available after the fact always at twit.tv slash wwa, w w. Uh, why does one letter have three syllables? You know, W W. <laughs> That's crazy talk. It's wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> whack, whack, whack. And then they chose it for the World Wide Web. W W W. That's right there. Six syllables before the dot. But that's a story for another day. <laughs> you see, the interrupt request got me going. That's what happened. It did. <laughs> We, uh, we also are on uh, all the better uh, uh, podcast clients and so forth. You can do it that way. In fact, if you subscribe, you won't miss an episode, and I know you don't want to. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you all next time on Windows Weekly.